Okay, well, maybe we should start with we'll, uh, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome, I'm Margaret Walton Roberts, a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University and a member of the Balsillie School of International Affairs and part of the My Food uh, Research Partnership Grant project. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the second day of our um, the second annual international migration conference on food insecurity and migrants on the move. We started our day yesterday with a welcome from the Bell City School director Anne Fitzgerald, who also did a land acknowledgement uh, to remind us of where we are and to remind us of the process of reconciliation that we are engaging with here in Canada with Indigenous communities. Um, I'm happy to start off the second day with a very exciting session. We have four papers uh, today in this session. I will ask each of the presenters to present for about 15 minutes, and then we will save questions to the end. If you have questions, please use the Q&A um, or the chat, depending on your preference. I will try to monitor those questions and uh, relay them to our speakers. But uh, this morning we have four sessions, four presentations. We will start our first presentation uh, with um, Chetan uh, Chotharani. He will be presenting on situating food security in the migration cycle of female migrant domestic workers from Kerala to GCC countries. And um, Chetan is an assistant professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. Um, he's also been a postdoctoral researcher at the Urban Studies Institute of Georgia State University. His PhD is in development geography from the University of Sydney, and his teaching and research interests are in migration and urbanization, uh, food, nutrition and livelihoods, especially as they relate to the Indian context. Um, so, Chetan, I'll pass it on to you. I think the title is different, uh, Margaret. The title is different. Yes, Chetan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Margaret uh, Walton Roberts, for the introduction. Uh, is my uh, is my PowerPoint uh, slide up? Uh, yes, we can, can see it. You can make it to us a slide so so that it will yeah. finish. Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, as uh, Professor Rajan said, that uh, our paper is on uh, uh, is on urban food security. Uh, this is a joint work that I'm uh, that I'm presenting. Uh, with my colleagues, Dr. Yudha Rajan, who's also the co-organizer of this conference, and Dr. Dr. Abdul Jalil of the National Institute of Nutrition in Hyderabad. Uh, and in uh, this paper, we focus on emerging urban spaces, which are formal rural regions acquiring urban character in terms of livelihood shifts uh, out of agriculture into non-farm occupation, as well as changes in built environment. But there's very little understanding of the food security implication of, uh, of this urban growth. Uh, I must also add that uh, what I'm going to present uh, are findings and issues from the preliminary investigation into the food security implication of India's rural urban transition. And the idea is that this will inform the field-based study that we wish to carry out next year. So, uh, so with that note, uh, let me uh, very briefly uh, set out the broad context and rationale for this work. So we, we're all too familiar with this, uh, with this graph that shows that uh, more of the world's population now lives in cities and towns uh, than rural regions and the number of urban dwellers is uh, uh, projected to rise further in future. Uh, but in terms of food security, what this means is that the issue of food security or insecurity is increasingly becoming an urban issue, raising a host of uh, uh, issues about food availability, access, and distribution. And, and while this demographic shifting in favor of urban has led to enormous research attention, research and policy attention diverted to understanding uh, the implication of this urban transition on various aspects of development in recent years, the issue of urban food security remains largely ignored uh, by policymaking and uh, academic community. The specialized UN institutions working on these issues tend to treat uh, food security largely as a rural issue still, and academic research too, barring uh, some of the very important work uh, done by my food research uh, researchers and also other organizations such as IFPRI, uh, shows this neglect. neglect. Um, the, the 
the the plausible reason uh, if, if you like for this neglect in food uh, of course the, the dominant discourse on food security still tends to uh, take a productivist view and focuses invariably more on what is uh, on strengthening what is largely a rural based food production system in urban studies you have celebration you know even uncritical celebration of cities that offer distinct urban advantage advantages in terms of well-being outcomes which also seems to add to this neglect uh, but what we see Uh, in many developing countries in, in Asia and Africa, which have high uh, food insecurity and malnutrition prevalence, and also places that are witnessing rapid urban growth, uh, is that living in urban area is not necessarily advantageous. Uh, and the reason is that in many parts of the uh, uh, developing world, um, urbanization is not really accompanied with decent jobs which was observed in the historical experience of today's advanced co uh, countries uh, so consequently uh, there's been an increase in urban poverty and undernourishment uh, and moreover process of urbanization in in many developing countries are increasingly led by uh, uh, small places usually involving formal rural regions turning into urban centers which is also leading to uh, what is being referred to as geographical decoupling of cities from traditional food sources and the resultant effect of these processes is that urbanization in developing countries is associated with multiple uh, burdens of malnutrition where uh, you see rise in overweight and obesity along with persistent uh, hunger and this is uh, particularly the case in india which uh, accounts for uh, a quarter of the total undernourished people in the world uh, in india agricultural uh, sector has traditionally provided an important source of income and food security for a large majority of country's population but the past few decades have witnessed tremendous stress on uh, farm based livelihoods and recent research shows that the uh, role of agriculture in uh, in 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 uh, food and nutrition security is significantly weakened and there now exists an agriculture and nutrition disconnect um, economic liberalization since early 1990 has resulted into urban and non farm sectors assuming greater significance in the in the overall framework of national income and employment and as a result there's been a massive shift of employment out of agriculture and because these jobs are now based in cities this has also resulted in significant increase in circular uh, in rural urban labor migration uh, but most urban jobs are informal and precarious uh, at the same time they still provide an important alternative to to millions of people moving out of agriculture but what this also means is that these job jobs preclude uh, a realistic opportunities for migrants to cities to settle in cities uh, on a more permanent basis so uh, the migration that you see uh, is circular in in nature and this is um, uh, reflected in the urbanization trends uh, as this graph uh, shows that uh, there has been a continual increase in the absolute number of urban dwellers Uh, uh in india over time and in 2011 which was when the last census was conducted there were about uh, 380 million people living in urban areas but this represented only 31% of the country's population uh, and and crucially uh, moreover uh, rapid economic growth has uh, which has also been urban centric hasn't really uh, uh, resulted in a commensurate increase in urbanization in india in fact some large cities uh, 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 such as kolkata are are losing uh, losing population uh, so so why this is the why why that is happening there are two um, broad set of uh, interrelated explanation uh one is that the india's urbanization has been exclusionary so india's urban economic growth has generated decent jobs for for a small section of highly skilled workforce for example you know you have it workers uh while uh, those without such skills which constitute a large majority of country's population to participate in this new um, uh, knowledge uh, uh, based economy are left out so so what they do is they engage in low wage informal jobs which doesn't really allow them to carve out more permanent urban lives as i said before and the second uh, explanation relates to how urban is defined in india so india follows two uh, definitions to classify places as urban first all places that have a uh, statutory administration such as a municipal corporation are considered urban uh, for all other places without uh, statutory governance they have to simultaneously meet three criteria Uh, and these include that they have a population of at least 5000 people density of 400 person or more per square kilometer and at least 75% of the male workers pursue non farm jobs now um 
and these are uh, 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 these are uh, uh, smallest urban units uh, which are uh, in official parlance called census towns now uh, uh, this threefold criteria is considered too stringent uh, and view uh, often seen to be one of the reasons why overall urbanization remains low in india but uh, despite uh, this uh, stringent criteria what we see is in the past decade there was a phenomenal growth in the census towns in india in in in, in just in between 2001 and 11 2532 new census towns were added in india's urban system a number which is almost as much as the number of census towns added in 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 the last 100 years and these are uh, uh, you know i must emphasize these are former agrarian regions that for the first time meet the uh, three four criteria uh, to be to be classified uh, as urban and some uh, primary research that i've been involved in with other colleagues shows that it is the exclusionary urbanization in large cities that seems to be fueling urban growth in these rural regions former rural regions uh, through circular migration and and, and remittance but even this uh, you know phenomenal growth of census towns uh, underestimates the growth uh, uh, urban growth at smaller places and um, we did some gis analysis uh, of village level population census data uh, and that shows that in 2011 there were 11000 settlements uh, uh, with a population of about 17 million um, uh, uh, that had 75% of more of their workers engaged in non farm occupations which I, as i said is one of the criteria for places to be classified as urban uh, and uh, uh, many of these settlements amalgamate uh, uh, in space to form larger clusters uh, uh, and but these are uh, out of the census radar they're still classified as rural but this uh, you know from the perspective of sort of the study what uh, this uh, high urban growth at, at these rural formal rural or formal agrarian regions makes for a very it makes for an important study of food security implication of this rural urban transition and this is where uh, uh, our research is uh, is focused um, so we identified uh, three um, uh, uh, pathways of linkages through uh, which India's uh, rural urban transition potentially weighs on food security outcomes, uh, including uh, a growing significance of non-farm incomes and, uh, uh, and households dependent on food purchases uh, or, or from the market. Uh, second, improved income from non-farm occupation and the dietary uh, changes that, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, it often results to and the resultant effect on overweight and obesity. And third, farmland conversion for urban use and, and, and food security. So, so to discuss the, the, the first of, of these pathways, uh, an important point to note um, uh, uh, here is that for a large majority of household in this transition, agriculture no longer serves as an effective source of food security. Food security. Households uh, do tend to hold on to land as a as a as a source of uh, financial security, given the precarious urban job, and also as a marker of cultural identity. But it doesn't adequately fulfill their land uh, food needs. Uh, 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 in fact, the majority of farmers in India are uh, what is uh, you know what is referred to as net food buyers, meaning that they purchase. Uh, uh, they produce less of their staple food than they uh, than, uh, uh, they consume. So so they depend on the market uh, to source their food needs. Um, and this uh, uh, one of the reasons also is that the land holdings in India are, are very small, and which provides a prompt for a greater non-farm livelihood diversification. And and this could be a positive thing. It could provide cash income for households to. Um, uh, access more food, uh, uh, improve their dietary diversity, um, and especially uh, it can also provide, given the declining uh, fortunes of farm-based jo jobs, it can also provide an important uh, uh, you know, cushion. Um, at the same time, detachment with farming also means that households rely, uh, you know, greater dependence uh, on market for, for food purchases. And, and this issue uh, assumes uh, a significance in the context of food price volatility that has characterized the global food system since the 2008 uh, uh, food crisis. Uh, you know, food inflation is a major issue facing the world today, not just developing countries, but, you know, uh, also uh, developed countries are battling um, uh, price spikes in basic commodities and food inflation is a major contributor to rising uh, cost of living. And, you know, as a recent IMF report also showed, 
uh, and in India, uh, prices of food have have uh, remained high over the past uh, 10 years from their base. Uh, fruits and vegetables currently are about 100% more than their base uh, prices, and even basic cereals, which uh, form the bulk of diets of the poor, are 70% uh, more expensive. And what food inflation means for urban dwellers who use their cash incomes for informal jobs uh, is that it dwindles their food uh, food budget. Uh, and there is evidence, uh, research done by Professor Jonathan Crush and others uh, from My Food Network, uh, in African context, that food remittances from rural areas uh, help uh, uh, the urban members uh, to cope up with these uh, uh, with these shocks. But uh, uh, research evidence in India suggests that uh, uh, um, that you know the way uh, urban poor seem to be coping. Uh, uh, there's some evidence uh, uh, during COVID is by reducing food consumption and dietary diversity. And our analysis of uh, India's National Family Health Survey also shows that food and nutritional deficits are increasingly concentrated in urban uh, urban areas, particularly affecting the poor. And as this graph shows that more than two times as many urban children from poor families are stunted and, and, and underweight compared to children from, uh, from better off uh, families. Um, the second effect, uh, you know, uh, is that at the same time, you know, non-farm li livelihood uh, diversification can lead to uh, improved incomes. And that also seems to be changing the food environment uh, uh, in, the, in the country, uh, leading to uh, rise in overweight and obesity. Um, uh, so this graph here shows the the body mass index of women uh, aged 18 to 49 years. And, um, you know, as the data suggests that the underweight prevalence is higher in, in rural areas, whereas overweight is greater in urban areas. And um, uh, what, we, um, uh, what we also find, um, uh, as is to be expected, is that the urban diets are generally better than rural diets, uh, you know, uh, perhaps owing to the uh, uh, better incomes. Uh, in, in that, that a greater proportion of urban women consume um, fruits, uh, eggs, fish, meat, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, their rural counterparts. But consumption of fried food, irritated drinks, uh, you know, which are you know, not uh, necessarily considered healthy foods, is also higher in urban area. But more importantly, our analysis shows that access to healthy food items uh, varies uh, significantly by economic status. So. The proportion of women who can who drink milk daily is about 30 percent uh, among the poor household and this proportion uh, is almost double at 66.4 percent among the uh, better off families similarly daily food consumption among women from poorest and richer quintile is 6 and 22 um, percent and as i said before poor population in urban areas find it difficult to afford costly healthy foods uh, and often rely on low-cost cereal-based diets so what you see um, uh, is, a, is a double burden of uh, malnutrition in urban area where, whereby urban poor suffer from undernourishment while the better off section have, uh, have overweight and obesity. Uh, um, and, and finally, the last pathway uh, is that the, uh, India's urban transition all is also, also seems to be affecting food security through changes in land use pattern. Uh, um, particularly, you know, farmland increasingly being uh, converted to, uh, to to support urban growth. So in just nine years, uh, this data is, uh, is, is a bit dated, but in just nine years, uh, 700,000 hectares of farmland was lost and a lot of it to, you know, to, to support urbanization and urban growth. And, and another important point to note here is that this farmland conversion is predominantly uh, uh, in states with, uh, with fertile land. Now, uh, what does that mean for food security? It does have implication for food production, um, but while there is no, uh, we don't have any evidence uh, of immediate decline in food production, and you know uh, that 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 is perhaps owing to the agricultural intensification. Um, um, this uh, loss of land uh, or land changes in land use pattern does raise question about the food availability, and particularly in the context of um, uh, climate change exerting uh, negatively on on agri food uh, system. Second, it not farm jobs may also result in a shift in cultural values toward farming, particularly among the youth, which again poses a challenge to long-term sustainability of food production. And uh, another uh, uh, important point is that this urban growth in these regions is also 
uh, uh, fueling land speculation in which traditionally disadvantaged communities are being further dispossessed of their land-based resources. So for example, Shidil caste and Shidil tribe population uh, being deprived of their you know, grazing uh, rights and uh, 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 which you know, uh, for their livestock, which often uh, is an important source of uh, food security. So um, in conclusion, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in conclusion, uh, what we find uh, is that rural urban transition seems to be associated with overall worsening of food security situation, uh, reading the data and studies that are that are available, particularly for the poor, but, but India's rural urban transition uh, remains very poorly understood in terms of you know, its food security implication. And what we hope to do as a next step is to carry out a systematic field-based study that generates um, holistic insights uh, on, on these processes. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Chetan. A lot to take in there. And as I said, we will save questions to the end. Uh, we'll move on to our second presentation that will um, give us a little more insight into issues of food security in India. Um, uh, we are very excited to have a presentation uh, by Dr. Sri Rupa. She's a research consultant at ISST and a senior research fellow at IMAD. She completed postdoctoral research at the Center for Women's Development Studies at King and at King's College London um, as part of an EU Horizon 2020 project. Uh, she has a PhD in economics um, from the Center on, for Development Studies um, and uh, JNU. And um, she has considerable um, experience researching and collaborating on development issues linked to gender migration and labor. And her presentation uh, will focus on the role of informal workers in the circular economy for food and urban food security in Delhi. Uh, thank you, Professor Margaret. Um, and thank you, Professor Irudeh Rajan, Professor uh, uh, Krush for this opportunity to uh, present our work. And so although this has been uh, uh, a last minute addition, and I have, we have worked together to put together this uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation for you. So uh, please excuse if there's any jumps in the. Uh... Good. So uh, today, I mean, uh, for the for last, I mean, from yesterday onwards, we have been looking at different aspects of uh, food security and particularly the linkages with migration. It has been really fascinating to listen to all the presentations, and I'm particularly grateful to the uh, presenter before me because he set up such a uh, wonderful context of uh, you know food insecurity and urbanization and particularly the challenges of food inflation uh, that's staring down at uh, uh, at most of the uh, you know poor people in India. So what I'm going to be doing through this presentation today is bring the focus of uh, this discussion on food security also to the circular economy for food and the question of food waste. So we have done this study at ISSD and me along with uh, my group of co-authors, Kritika and Dr. Janvi, we're part of this study. Uh, this was done in collaboration with Vigo and we are the commissioning partners. Uh, so we looked at the informal livelihoods uh, that have uh, contributed to the circular economy for food and we look at the urban food security in Delhi. So India basically faces what can be called a hunger food waste paradox because although India is the second largest food producer in the world, but we have very abysmal uh, food uh, hunger index status. So we have nearly 195 million people in India who go to bed hungry every day as per the UN data, uh, whereas there are tons of food which goes to waste every year. So this high level of Really does aggravate the poverty situation in India because it uh, has challenges access to food, particularly for the most vulnerable uh, population. And one of the biggest contributors to climate change is also our, uh, you know, uh, food system because it generates a considerable amount of solid waste as well as, uh, especially when the uh, landfills are kind of overflowing and. Uh, filling up beyond their capacity and also it remits uh, it emits a lot of greenhouse gases with detrimental effect to climate change so what this basically highlights is that there's a need for 
for transitioning to a circular economy for food. And there's a lot of discourse that's been going on uh, in favor of that. Uh, but what we have largely seen is that a circular economy for food uh, is generally spoken about in the context of ecological uh, benefits, environmental benefits, and what technological changes can be brought about. And it uh, usually misses one of the important pillars of, uh, of the circular economy, which is the informal workforce. And through a focus uh, to the urban poor and the informal workers who contribute to the circular economy, uh, there is a case to be made because we can contribute to the achievement of several of the sustainable development goals. So before going any further, uh, I would like to um, discuss the concept of circular economy as we understand it right now. Uh, the concept of circular economy is uh, has emerged as an alternative to the take, make, use, and dispose linear economy, which is what we actually see around us right now. And the circular economy concept has three main pillars, uh, as it has been laid out. One is uh, eliminating waste and pollution by reducing the use of non-renewable resources, uh, keeping products and materials in circulation by reusing and recycling whenever possible, regenerating nature through more conscientious use of natural resources. So the idea of circular resource flow has long been there at the heart of the work of informal uh, repair reuse uh, workers, particularly in the context of the global south, because we see a range of informal and traditional workers who have been engaged in work like, you know, there have been tailors, there have been cobblers, there have been um, kabadiwalas who are basically itinerant uh, scrap dealers who have always worked in uh, bringing back waste to use. Uh, however, the way that uh, con uh, circular economy concept has been discussed largely these days, it is thought of as a concept which comes from the north, uh, wherein uh, the focus remains on environment. I mean, in ecology, as I mentioned earlier, and then we kind of miss out on the informal workers, although they are the vital part of the circular economy, uh, but they seem to be largely overlooked in research, advocacy work, as well as engagements in the circular economy. So this idea for this project also came from there, wherein we wanted to kind of... Uh, bring the attention to the informal workers and the idea came from our uh, uh, partners the global vigo team um, wherein we wanted to document and create evidence of the valuable contribution that these informal workers make in the reuse repair economy uh, out through their work uh, the environment as well as uh, the livelihoods for the urban poor is protected uh, so this is basically our uh, our research aim. And the method and sampling basically involved a community-based cost sectoral descriptive study based in India, uh, based in Delhi in India. Uh, the study basically looked at six different case studies, but for this particular paper, I'll be focusing on a very unique case study, um, wherein uh, we looked into how the food waste generated in a wholesale market was kind of uh, processed, cleaned, sorted, segregated, and resold in the, um, in the street markets by the informal workers. So we basically relied on in-depth interviews with the workers and observation of them doing their work as well as while uh, uh, vending uh, in the street markets. We also, since the idea was also to capture the circularity of the flow of the waste material, we interviewed uh, one group of uh, stakeholders, uh, both forward linkage as well as backward linkage. And we also interview different uh, key informants to get a better understanding. So the study basically involved informal workers, waste collectors, home-based workers, street vendors, and dealers engaged in this work in Delhi. So as I mentioned, uh, this basically captures the reuse economy, uh, uh, which was located in the Sadar Bazaar area. And this is actually one of the, uh, this Sadar Bazaar area includes two very prominent wholesale markets. It has the Naya Bazaar, which is one of the largest uh, uh, wholesale market for food grains and pulses in India. And other is the Khari Bauli market, which is one of the largest uh, wholesale market for spices in whole of Asia. Uh, so what happens in these markets is if you look at the picture uh, uh, at your, left-hand side corner, uh, the food products are basically 
stored and sold in these kind of gummy bags in uh, sometimes in an open display. Uh, the transportation of these food materials through gunny bags also means there's a lot of wastage and through spilling, uh, while transportation, while uh, displaying the product, while selling the products um, in these markets. So whatever food grains get uh, spilled in the floor are collected by different informal workers um, who collect this and then process it and sell it in the street-based uh, markets. And uh, an interesting thing about this, this particular case study was that we found that uh, almost all of the uh, workers who were engaged in this work were uh, belonged to a, belonged to uh, a particular district around Bihar, the migrant community, who had come to Delhi in different phases. You know, some had lived in Delhi for much longer, and some were like uh, a new entrants to the city and had found their livelihood in and around the southern bazaar market. Uh, so this is just to give you a sense of the you know complex flow of uh, uh, material, uh, food waste material from its source, which are these wholesale markets of Naha Bazaar and Haribawli. Also, some of the large FDI go downs which are uh, around Delhi, and then its final destination, which is one of the main destinations, is the street-based Sunday market, which happens near the uh, wholesale market itself. Um, and the other retail markets and all, which I'll go to uh, go in much detail. So the, the 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 source, as I mentioned, is the wholesale market um, and the go downs around Delhi, as well as we discovered the garbage dumps. So whatever food which gets we uh, dumped sometimes in the in the in the nearby garbage dumps, were also scavenged by a uh, different group of informal workers. So just like the waste, we found that the, there was also hierarchy in the informal workers as well. So the best quality of waste was the uh, waste that was, if you can call it a waste, where the samples which were discarded, which were used for trading. Um, and there would be a group of workers who would come and collect it. It could be a guard of one of these wholesale shops or the go-downs. And it could also be uh, women who come uh, to beg or uh, come to sweep near those wholesale shops and then they would be collecting these, uh, these samples. Uh, other forms of waste, as I mentioned, were the food grains which were spilled across uh, near the, near the um, wholesale market, uh, the food grains which would get wasted or spoiled in the go-downs, and uh, also fallen food grains near the shop. So the waste was either collected um, or sometimes bought, like some of the own account workers would purchase. Uh, when they uh, are purchasing waste in larger quantities, they would approach the go-downs or the um, official uh, cleaners of, the, of, this, of these particular markets and purchase large quantities of food waste from them, uh, which could be in quintals, and process them through uh, employing uh, sometimes unpaid family labor and sometimes hired uh, workers uh, and the other for uh, the other category of uh, workers as I mentioned were the female workers who would sweep the surroundings of the market or would beg uh, for um, for uh, samples of the waste and the final category and whom we thought were really at the bottom of this hierarchy where uh, beggars and waste pickers would scavenge the garbage dumps for any food waste that was uh, available and which was again sorted and sometimes used for personal use or sometimes you know bartered or sold. The final destination for some of these uh, food material was uh, uh, in the street uh, in the Sunday street market was usually low income households uh, who would come there from near and far uh, across Delhi and the MCR region um, to purchase uh, food commodities, food grains, pulses um, in different quantities as one of the advantages and attraction for these uh, consumers was uh, in co comparison to the wholesale market where they could only purchase, uh, you know, food, con food commodities in large quantities. Here they were av available to them in smaller quantities and at much lower prices. Another category of people whom we, have, whom we found uh, who approached this market were small retailers who possibly had set up their uh, retail shops in uh, low-income uh, areas of uh, different parts of Delhi. 
we even uh, heard from the workers that hoteliers and event organizers would also sometimes source uh, food commodities, spices from these informal workers. And the lowest quality of food uh, waste, which could not be kind of retrieved or uh, was not reusable, uh, usually went for animal feed, and uh, people would come and purchase it to be used as animal feed. So the picture here shows uh, the work process uh, that's involved in uh, cleaning and sorting. Uh, in this case, a mixed masala uh, that they are cleaning and sorting. So the work process is very uh, labor intensive and tedious, which involves multiple stages of processing and cleaning. Uh, using different kinds of sieves, which holds to kind of sort and uh, separate different categories of uh, uh, of different categories of masalas in this case, but similarly for different pulses and lentils as well. The idea was really to let nothing go to waste and get as much uh, usable food material out of the waste, and this would then be segregated, sorted, and graded and uh, put in, you know, uh, uh, different gunny bags to be sold in the street market. So, although such kind of work is usually not associated with skill, but we found that the work involved a lot of uh, traditional community-based community knowledge which has been passed on to uh, them from either their relatives or their own experience of working with uh, uh, other informal workers, wherein they get the knowledge about the quality of the product, how do they grade it, and also skills such as, you know, uh, uh, involved in trading, like bargaining with the, uh, with the Safai Karamchari when they're making those purchases, and also during trading with the consumers. Because this is largely a very price-conscious market, because uh, in an in extremely resource-poor setting, so there's a lot of negotiation which happens around the price of the product. Sorry. Uh, so, so this there was a significant contribution that these informal workers were making to the waste prevention um, in the in, in this particular uh, case study, and. Uh, uh, the women workers whom I had spoke to about, spoken about earlier would, on an average, uh, process about 30 to 40 kgs of waste, uh, earning around 1,000 to 5,000 rupees per week. Uh, but the own account worker who could hire a labor to do the processing of waste uh, could uh, process as much as 20 to 40 kgs of material per, per day, uh, about 2.5 quintals uh, in a good week. Uh, despite the significant contribution that these uh, workers were making, how much time do I have, Margaret? Um, we're at uh, 15 minutes, so if you could kind of wrap up, that would be great. Sure, sure. So despite the significant contribution that these workers were making, they were also faced with a number of challenges. Since this work is associated with dirt, uh, impurity and waste and particularly has connotations uh, uh, in, in, in a society uh, like India. So there's a lot of social stigma associated with this work uh, because of which uh, it is also highly invisibilized work and it's also it does not fall within the legal realm of uh, work with food. And what we found was that these workers also faced a lot of challenge in accessing to waste because food inflation has been so high that uh, the food waste which was once readily available to them is no longer accessible to them and most often they are having to purchase uh, the food waste. Uh, they were they live in slums uh, in many conditions and with, uh, uh, with, with, with poor access to workspace. Um, because of the illegality involved in their work and the space of living, they also face a lot of harassment from the police and the municipal authorities, uh, as well as because they sometimes use up the railway lines to do their work, uh, harassment from them as well. Uh, but the workers themselves did associate a lot of value and contribution to their work. So they did see that there's the precious source of livelihood for themselves, as you can see in this uh, narrative uh, uh, of the worker. And then they see it as an important source of sustenance for them. 
they were also able to associate that uh, the contribution in terms of providing affordable food com commodities and food security for the urban poor in times of high inflation. In fact, one of the workers said that if the government supports us, this market is very good according to the budget of poor people. And one of the uh, things which they often repeated was that this is a market which is accessible for the urban poor, uh, whereas the other wholesale markets and the nearby retail were not. Nevertheless, they did suffer from the stigma that was associated with this work. They did uh, feel it very intensively. Uh, they associated this work and their living conditions with Kuda, which is garbage, and Gandhi, which is filth, and what did better future for their own children. So to kind of sum up, uh, the informal workers here were clearly at the core of the circular economy for food and almost nothing was allowed to go to waste. So they make a major contribution in conserving uh, food commodities and in avoiding and reducing the food wastage. Further, one of the important, I think, takeaways for us uh, and which we uh, certainly did not expect as we started off the study was a significant uh, positive social impact of this uh, reuse economy on food provisioning for the urban poor. So what they were doing essentially was providing a social safety net to the urban poor against the rising cost of living in the cities. However, this work still remained highly stigmatized social stigmatized labor performed was also by uh, some of the most marginalized communities uh, uh, in India. Uh, particularly in India, where dealing with waste and scrap has through the lens of dirt and purity and caste division of labor, this work has been kind of relegated to the Dalits uh, and the backward communities, uh, particularly migrants who come to the city looking for a, for a living. Uh, okay, as I we, mentioned we earlier, now? Yes, this is, yeah. yes this, is the, this is the last point. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the workers uh, are living under extremely precarious working conditions. Uh, so the state owes these informal workers support and protection for their effort and contribution to the circular economy, environment, uh, poverty reduction, and food security. And there's a scope for the, uh, for the state to bring in more positive uh, policy changes to accommodate uh, these informal workers. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Shripa. That was such a, an insightful um, kind of look at these the marginal markets. There was um, a comment, a question about what is a go-down. I believe a go-down is a warehouse or a storage facility. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's great to answer that. So let's move along to our third presentation. Uh, this time we're going to be looking at the experiences gain of uh, migrant workers, but this time migrant domestic workers. Uh, we'll be looking at food, care, chains, and commensality in pandemic times, migrant domestic workers, relational food insecurity in Southeast Asia. And this presentation uh, is made by Chand Soma. Uh, she's presenting on behalf of a team from the National University of uh, Singapore. And so Chand, if I could invite you to put up your slides and introduce the other members of the team. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Margaret, for that introduction. Um, can, I, uh, can you see me, my slides? Sorry, yeah. sorry, I meant to introduce you in the... Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, forgive me. I'd no. like to... Yeah, I, I feel as if I know you so well, but obviously our audience do not. So Chand owns a, uh, has a joint appointment as a research fellow with the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore and Yale NUSU, uh, NUS College. Her research interests are in intimate citizenship practices such as food work um, and embodied in placed and intersectional subjectivities. Since 2017, she's been working on a collaborative mixed methods research project investigating the impacts of parental absence on left behind children and families from sending communities of international labor. Um, so again, sorry, apologies for that, Shan, please go ahead. 
Okay, um, good day everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to present this paper on behalf of my uh, co-authors as well, uh, Professor Brenda Yeo, Ms. Crystal Asadera, and Dr. Theodora Lam. Um, thank you to Professor Crash, uh, Professor Rajan, uh, Tin Jong, and Joanne uh, for helping to organize this, and thank you to Professor uh, Margaret Walton Roberts uh, for chairing, and my fellow panelists for their very insightful papers. So let me proceed uh, with this presentation. Um, marginalized communities face heightened food security challenges in the current pandemic environment. Um, the stalled return of mothers prolong independence, uh, pr sorry, prolonged dependence on father and surrogate caregivers. There are harsh repercussions uh, of economic recession, which increases dependence on remittances uh, from maternal migration. In times of a global pandemic, uh, the lack of a robust um, Public healthcare infrastructure, particularly in parts of Southeast Asia, puts increased uh, pressure on uh, privatized family based uh, provisions of care. So migrant women struggle with precarious conditions at their destinations um, to meet their own needs and also those of their left behind family members. In Southeast Asia, women are generally the linchpin of healthcare and food work in families. Um, and despite being physically away from their families, migrant mothers continue to play a very important role in ensuring that the health and food needs of their left behind family members are being well taken care of, um, either by themselves uh, through long distance or through specifically chosen surrogate caregivers in their home countries. The emotional and physical burden of caregiving often falls to uh, upon another woman. Uh, often it's the grandmother or, or an aunt. Uh, quantitative studies have explored uh, rates of child undernutrition um, and stunting between left behind children cared for by fathers and non parental caregivers. Um, so this kind of parallels uh, what the previous speaker Chetan spoke about in terms of um, stunting. Um, there's also we find in Indonesia and the Philippines uh, high levels of malnutrition among children um, and lots of hidden hunger. Um, Studies of left behind children's health and appetite has also uh, been studied, um, but our qualitative work examines in greater depth maternal um, strategies of doing food work through the accounts of mother migrants in their own voices. Uh, so food work involves the tangible, cognitive, emotional labor often required in cooking, producing meals and snacks for others. Uh, maternal food work specifically has been defined as the practices that form the key food activities and exchanges between mothers and children. This involves planning, purchasing, preparation, eating, and the emotional and domestic management of children's um, diets. So while family food work is often interdependent, the maternal food work we investigate in our project is not only relational within the nuclear family itself, um, but is embedded within larger left behind family contexts and extends across national borders, particularly among um, transnational families embedded in this low wage migrant labor. So via food work where mothers are placed at the forefront of responsibility and where mothers are positioned as family frontliners in this pandemic, um, our paper explores uh, food care between migrant mothers, uh, left behind family and even fictive kin um, at the sites of, of destination. Um, through an additional focus on maternal migrant food work, uh, we extend studies of everyday food work among the poor uh, to achieve food security in agentic and original ways. Relational food work and remittances for food uh, become expectations um, of left behind family members. Uh, so uh, food care is, has been defined um, as the, the work that low income mothers do as an alternative to the logic of capital for the demonstration of self worth. Self worth. Um, it is through the concept of food care that uh, Parsons et al. seeks to capture the non commodifiable elements of food work. So, the potential agentic quality of food care also uh, resides in the creativity and in the competence needed to feed the family under constrained and uh, changing circumstances. Arrhenius's International Division of Reproductive Labor and Hochschild's Global Care Chain approach, uh, it captures the transnational networks of sustained um, care for the purposes of securing uh, paid employment in host countries, um, all the while ensuring left behind family members and children receive care at home. So um, in this paper, we argue for the notion of food care chains as a form of food work to be included within the care chains literature, which currently neglects food security. Um, this primarily is a reason for migration and as an ongoing maternal struggle for, for migrant families. Now, moving to the Singapore context, um, Singapore ranks third uh, regionally in terms of food security um, 
uh, in the Asia Pacific. Yet, uh, data AL has found that food scarcity and low quality of foods compounded with financial insecurity was common among foreign domestic workers. Uh, so migrant domestic workers from Myanmar comprise the third largest nationality uh, behind 125,000 Indonesians and 70,000 Filipinos uh, in Singapore. So the Ministry of Manpower um, stipulates um, you know, provisions that employers must ensure uh, that migrant domestic workers have enough food. Um, I've spoken about this in a previous uh, presentation, so I'll just uh, move on to the next point. Um, some struggles that have been identified uh, by migrant domestic workers in Singapore include um, control over food intake by employers, um, irregular meal times, um, sometimes not having access to the pantry or cooking appliances, uh, sometimes having to consume um, employers' leftovers, stale food, uh, not getting medical attention, and other various forms of abuse. Even in public spaces, uh, Ho has written about how uh, there are barriers to access in, um, to even uh, barbecue pits in public. So uh, the methods um, we use for this paper, we're drawing upon findings from 55 qualitative interviews with migrant domestic workers based, based in Singapore around themes uh, surrounding migration, food security, and care work. Um, so these uh, interviews are primarily from two projects. One is the healthcare and food work among, among left behind grandparents um, in migrant sending villages in Southeast Asia. And the other one is on food security among Myanmarese domestic workers in Singapore. Um, so we're focusing on food work, food security, uh, and we're also interested in, in the gendered and generational care relationships between migrant mothers and their left behind family members. And the, and the migrant women we speak to come from Indonesia, the Philippines, and Myanmar. So now I'm going to the slide, which I'm going to spend uh, the most time on. Um, so if you could just bear with me uh, for, the, for the rest of the presentation. Uh, so what we're trying to argue is that food care chains um, occur along three kinds of, of modes. Uh, firstly, um, we argue that they are multi-relational. So food care is extended not just to biological children, but to other left behind family members as well in a variety of ways. Some of these include um, as a form of reciprocity um, and to gratify maternal proxies, uh, such as left behind caregivers, including spouses, siblings, grandparents, in-law. Um, it's also as a form of community building and doing family in absentia. Um, so some occasions where mothers can perform this food work is uh, through ordering food or ensuring this food for celebrations like children's milestones, such as birthdays, organizing large family feasts uh, for the extended family from abroad. Uh, food care to and left behind context requires relational, intergenerational and mutual support of left behind caregivers. So the food care that migrant mothers um, encompass include uh, include these caregivers too. So mother's proxy food work is enabled by left behind carers um, and thus mother's food care envelopes their food needs as well, not just um, the left behind children's food needs. So I'm briefly going to tell you uh, about the story of Joanna, who is uh, from the Philippines. She's 47 years old. She's got four children. She's separated. Um, she says she didn't have a choice when she chose to migrate. Uh, she basically chose to migrate so that her children don't starve. Uh, she says our lives were like hell. Facing severe insecurity, food insecurity, her family relied on the help of um, relatives um, and neighbors for food. Uh, re she recalled uh, being her family being fed just uh, five pieces of fish. It reached to a point where we didn't really have anything to eat, she says. So um, facing food insecurity themselves, um, her husband's alcoholic, alcoholic parents um, fed the children just corn. Um, so um, she basically uh, contemplated suicide at one point before realizing that um, she needs to migrate. Um, and now as the migrant, she doesn't take um, her children's food uh, insecurity for granted. She doesn't take this trauma for granted. She regularly communicates um, to, with her children to check there's enough food at home. She says um, when, when we don't have rice anymore, she starts getting paranoid. So nightly she checks um, with her children what they've eaten and what side dishes they have. Uh, she remains anxious and concerned about their food security, um, recalling one of the children's birthdays where they didn't have anything to eat apart from eggs. So she communicates with them regularly and um, she feels relieved when her children tell her that they're buying delicious food with the remittances, remittances she sends. Um, and But she still says sometimes when eggs are the only food available, she's, she's relieved that at least there's something. Um, she also sends remittances to left behind family relations, um, apart from her children, because she says, uh, my conscience will bother me if I saw them go hungry. So um, 
this is the thing to do with uh, the multi-relationality about uh, on food care chains. And I move on um, to horizontal food care uh, chains within the Singapore context. So uh, we were doing our research during um, what uh, the Singapore version of the lockdown, which was called the circuit breaker. Um, so this is when uh, usually domestic workers have one day off a week, and this is usually used to socialize and eat um, culturally familiar foods with other uh, friends and peer networks. Um, but I'm going to share um, Kamuning's uh, story. She's 45 years old from Indonesia. Her migration was also prompted by a stark food uh, insecurity um, and so much so that she even got her daughter to come to Singapore as well as another as a domestic worker in another household. Um, so at the moment, her days off, Kamuning's days off involve her smuggling food to her daughter. Um, she says that her daughter does not have any days off. So she says every week I go there to see her and bring her food. Um, she says, I just see her from the window. She's not allowed to go out. Um, if her boss finds out, that's not good. So she sometimes brings Indonesian food. Uh, she says, there's not a lot of Indonesian food here. So I cook it and bring it over there. Um, and then she returns home uh, uh, immediately after that. Sometimes when she goes out with friends, she brings uh, leftovers um, from her cooking at home to share with her friends outside. Um, a lot of the women we spoke to spoke about um, how uh, the circuit breaker was a time of extreme loneliness and involved more food work for them at the, at the side of the employer's house. Um, Migrant domestic workers in Singapore are obligated by law to stay in uh, at, their, at their employer's house, so this often uh, produces um, problems with food uh, insecurity. Now, the third um, the third realm where this plays out is also when food becomes health uh, or, or food becomes a means of doing healthcare, um, and this is often anticipatory. It's cost avoiding. Um, um, Many women spoke to us about herbal drinks they consume. So in Indonesia, it's, it's jamu. So um, they're taking all the stuff to, to keep COVID at bay, uh, consuming more vitamin C, vitamin D, um, even virgin coconut oil. Um, so let me just share uh, the case of Nila, who's from Myanmar. Uh, she's 30 years old and divorced with uh, three children. Uh, she's determined for her children in this pandemic uh, time to eat food with the necessary nutrients, to eat food which benefits them. Um, she says, we aren't rich. We can't afford to eat a lot like the others. So to enhance the nutritional value of her children's meals, uh, she performs food care from Singapore and in terms of advising them what to eat, so to add more vegetables. Um, she also has learned uh, some things from a nutrition class that so she's trying to get her children children to apply that. Um, she tells them to eat water spinach uh, and to try and have meat. And if that's not available, to have eggs for protein. She even says even oil has its own uh, nutrition. Um, she constantly tells them to make a little go last a long way. Uh, so she kind of increases, the, tries to maximize the mileage uh, from their limited food sources. Uh, she gives them Appleton vitamins to help with brain development and also vitamins that help with height, right? This is um, fear of, of, of stunting. She says, even if we don't have much money, even like with one dish, um, we need to make sure that our body gets enough uh, nutrients. So um, let me move on to the conclusion of this paper. We offer unheard narratives uh, on food insecurity in Singapore and contribute to the multivocality and complexity of these narratives of transnational food insecurity among transient workers um, here. We interrogate the challenges of food insecurity faced by these migrant domestic workers, uh, the opportunities and constraints in achieving their personal and also household food security. Bearing in mind their motivations, plans, and aspirations in embarking on migration in the first place, we foreground migrant women's food work in relation to the needs and demands of their left behind families under increasingly stressful conditions res resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. So we argue not just for a relational understanding of food work, but further a relational appreciation of food care, that is low income maternal food work within a global context of uh, labor migration. And this is also, uh, we need to be aware, this is, uh, these are embedded within highly racialized transnational care chains, which are enacted with varying magnitudes um, under food insecurity amidst the pandemic related, all these personal family, employer and state expectations um, and surveillance. Uh, so through our findings, we argue for more equitable food access and healthcare in a climate of increasing pressure for long-term remittance-driven maternal migration. All this is precarious work, um, particularly in, in pandemic-affected Southeast Asia. So uh, with that, I just want to um, acknowledge our funders, um, the SSHRC and the Nihar Grant, um, and I've just listed some references there. So um, yeah, I think I hopefully, hopefully have kept to my 15 minutes, and I'll stop sharing now. 
Yes, you did, Chan. Thank you so much. That was such a fascinating presentation. I love the idea of the food care chains. Um, really, really insightful. And um, we are moving on to our, our fourth presentation, which will um, actually be a video um, looking at migrant anxieties and informality in secondary South African cities. Um, this paper is going to be presented uh, by video by Godfrey um, Tawadzira from the University of um, Namibia. Uh, Godfrey is um, an associate professor, professor in the Department of Environmental Science um, at the University of Namibia. He's previously worked at the University of Limpopo and the University of Zimbabwe. Um, he has been involved in numerous studies on food security and migration and has published extensively in these fields. Um, so we'll be watching the video. Um, and can I ask the uh, presenters, please feel free to answer the questions that the audience have posed in the Q&A in the chat, uh, because we may not have time for as many questions as we, as we would like by the end. So please, while the video presentation is going, feel free to answer the questions that have been posed in the Q&A. And to our audience, feel free to pose your questions, especially to um, Chand and the team from NUS. Uh, thank you. I'm going to be presenting on the topic migrant anxieties and informality in South African cities. Uh, my apologies, I've had to record um, due to an emergency that I have to attend to. But nevertheless, uh, let me make the presentation. I want to acknowledge the fact that this presentation is done in conjunction with Jonathan Fash. Um, as a way of introduction, um, we know that much of the urban food security studies have been have focused on larger uh, urban centers, larger cities. And um, there is not much that has been done in um, secondary cities. Whereas we know that secondary cities are important not only because of the rapid uh, expansion in terms of uh, high population growth, but also because these are the cities or urban centers that have very little resources to be able to attend to the wide tourist challenges that they face. So when you talk of food uh, insecurity, uh, this is one of the challenges that we would expect in the secondary cities. But why are we concerned about the informal sector? And this is because the informal sector is an integral part of the food system. First, because it plays a significant role in food distribution, allowing those people that live in areas that are serviced by, formal, by the formal food system to have access to food. The second issue is that the informal sector allows for the breaking down of power so that indigent population, the people that live in these urban areas, especially in the low income areas, are able to access and to buy uh, food in quantities that they can afford. But we also know that the informal sector is significant. It plays a important or crucial role in terms of employment and in terms of income, uh, which two issues are important when you talk of uh, food security. Africa is home to many migrants, and this is partly because it is strong economically, that is comparatively strong, strong economically in the region, and therefore attracts migrants. The second thing is that it is politically stable, and therefore people from other countries in the region come uh, to South Africa. There's been many studies on xenophobia in general, but lesser concentration on the second of cities that I've indicated before. In the past decade or so, we've seen an expansion of the South African informal sector. And this is a sector in which uh, those that are unable to find employment move into in order to be able to construct their livelihoods. And this is an area for both uh, locals and migrants. 
The presence of locals and migrants in the informal sector, however, uh, results in stiff competition. That is competition for spaces, competition for customers, and has of late um, resulted in an increase or has seen heightened increases of xenophobia. So there are xenophobic attitudes uh, towards uh, migrants. This is a negative impact on the livelihoods, uh, not only of the migrant migrants, uh, but also of the food security of their customers. Because when they are pushed out of an area, uh, it does reduce access, that is food access. But are migrants and locals equally affected? In order to answer this question and others that we may pose as we go along, we carried out um, a study in the Limpopo province, concentrated primarily on six towns, which is the town of Kolokwani, Tolondoi, um, Sina, Louis Trickard, Sanin, and in Vegas Fort. We administered 503 questionnaires uh, to international migrants and 566 uh, questionnaires to internal migrants, which served as our control. Uh, the participants in these six towns were randomly selected. In addition to the questionnaires, we also carried out 36 in-depth interviews and four uh, focus group discussions. So here are the results. You will find, if you look at the table, that uh, of them were from within the Sardic region, primarily from Zimbabwe and the DRC, but there were also others from other regions of Africa, uh, East Africa, for example. Uh, we have countries such as Ethiopia, uh, Somalia, but we also had um, others from Ghana, Nigeria, and Eritrea. Also, other migrants from Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, that is from Asia. So these are migrants coming from all over the world. The time of arrival just told us that the majority arrived in 2005, 2009, 2010, and 2014. Um, although there are others that have arrived, they arrived well before that. Um, what the results show is that um, most of the migrants usually settle in the larger cities, uh, Wandsburg, Cape Town. Uh, Port Elizabeth, and so on. Um, however, there is also evidence of diffusion that is, these uh, migrants later on move to the smaller uh, urban centers, the ones that we are calling the center cities. Um, I was also sure that there was movement from within centers in Bobo, for example, 15.5% uh, of those that we interviewed moved within the Bobo itself. But um, what is instructive to note is that the movement from the larger urban centers to smaller urban centers or from within the province itself uh, is a result of three key factors. One, that the uh, migrants were seeking of new opportunities in the smaller urban centers. Uh, the second fact is that there was competition in the larger urban centers, and therefore, by moving to the smaller urban area, the migrants were moving away from stiff competition. Uh, there is also an issue of, of what uh, Piper and Sherman call violent entrepreneurship. Uh, what happens in most of these large urban centers is that uh, rather than simply competing with the migrants, the locals sometimes adopt attitudes uh, of violently pushing these migrants out. Uh, so Sherman and Piper have called it violent entrepreneurship, pushing out your competitor physically so that you are able to remain and serve the customers without uh, or with less competition. And the third aspect is that the movement to the smaller urban centers is usually by um, uh, migrants fleeing xenophobic violence, which is characteristic of the larger urban centers. Our results show that both migrants and locals experience conflict with the other group. For example, um, verbal insults, uh, no, not necessarily con it's, uh, just conflict uh, with, with each other, and also conflict within groups, uh, and that conflict is the result of competition. 
and that's what uh, migrants, that is international migrants and local migrants, are also vulnerable to crime. However, there are four distinct um, trends that we need to talk about. One is the fact that international migrants comparatively experience uh, prejudice because of their nationality. And you can see here about 47.6% of the uh, international migrants reported experiencing prejudice against their nationality in comparison to 1.1% of South Africans. Also, high levels of labor in the South against their business. And you can actually see 35.3% of the migrants compared to this by nine percent of Africa. Higher levels of violent attacks against businesses. Um, so migrants also experience the high levels of attacks against their businesses. And then also higher levels of confiscation of goods by police. You see that 18.8% uh, of the migrants are reported having their goods confiscated in comparison to 0.9% of the locals. This brings us to another issue about policy and xenophobia. When all these things are happening, are the migrants protected? Masuku and Stenberg in 2012 point to the existence of xenophobia in the ranks of subs and municipal police. In other words, when cases are reported to them, the way they deal with the migrants is different from the way they deal with the locals. In 2013, for example, in the Limpopo province, there was Operation Hard Stick, which shut down migrant business. In fact, over 6,000 businesses were closed down, either by the police or by the local communities. A feeling aggrieved, uh, the migrants through their organizations approached the courts and took the case up to the Supreme Court. They won the case in the Supreme Court, and uh, the observation by the Supreme Court um, is quite instructive. And uh, I will quote what the Supreme Court said. Uh, regarding the police actions. It says that the police actions tell a story of the most net form of xenophobic discrimination, discrimination and the utter desperation experienced by the victims of the discrimination. Having won this case, um, uh, having the support of the law on their side, did the protection improve? Did the attacks stop? I've just shown here a few of the accounts by uh, the uh, people that we interviewed during the in-depth interviews and during the focus group session. And they tell a story of systematic xenophobia. One says that if you are a partner, and that the people who are at the forefront of xenophobia, they first break into the shops and they ban. Banning is to make sure that you don't recover, but it is also um, destroy evidence that could be used by the police to track down the perpetrators. Uh, others indicated that they had seen people being robbed and killed, and so they thought of going to other areas, for example, in Orange Farm. But the fact remains that as a foreigner, they are always conscious of their security, and you can feel that the, the place uh, is not good. Movement to these smaller urban centers is uh, generally to improve safety. It is a safety and security uh, measure. But uh, another one also shows us the systematic harassment by police and asking for bribes. And this one, um, a migrant being told expressly that uh, by the police that they don't want to die for his safety. So these are some of the key issues. Um, here you can also see uh, that others have expressed how uh, their goods were destroyed and their, how they are subjected to um, paying protection money and to paying bribes so that their businesses can continue to exist without uh, harassment. But more telling is the fact that others raised the issue that if you report to the police, uh, whatever amount has been stolen from you, from you, you are not only putting yourself in danger of the thieves, but you are also putting yourself or setting yourself up uh, for bribes because the police will generally know how much you make and therefore how much they can make up of you. So what is the conclusion? Uh, we point out first that this is one of the studies to systematically investigate anti migrant xenophobia in certain cities. 
compared to uh, migrant, uh, local migrants. In all these um, um, quotes that I've uh, alluded to, we find uh, that migrants are more exposed than the locals. By comparison, only a few of the South African business owners reported either demands for bribes uh, by the police, which was 4% of the locals in comparison to 26% of the migrants, or even confiscation of goods, which was just 5% for the locals in comparison to 19% for the, for the migrants. So comparatively, migrants were exposed and remain exposed to xenophobia, uh, criminality, and other um, factors. So xenophobia still exists in the small event centers. We've pointed out at the beginning that some of the uh, migrants moved from the larger event centers to the smaller event centers as a security measure. However, they found that xenophobia also still exists in those smaller centers and they remain targeted. That the acts of um, xenophobia against them and their businesses are random, indiscriminate, and destructive. Um, in that they are migrants are likely more likely to be victims of looting, theft, and violence. There is also evidence of institutionalized xenophobia. Uh, the quotes that we've alluded to they show an equivalent that the police uh, deal with the migrants differently than when they are dealing with the locals, and therefore international migrants expect very little or no help from the police. The impact of the destruction of these businesses is quite immense. And negatively impacts on food security of the migrants, but it also impacts on the food security of the local people or the local community because uh, destruction of these uh, businesses and the movement of these foreigners out of the areas usually in general leaves the local people without adequate sources of food and therefore reducing access and negatively impacting on food security. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you um, to all of our panelists. That's such a wonderful collection of presentations uh, that overlap and uh, speak to so many similar issues. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes, just under 10 minutes to answer questions. And uh, looking at the questions that we have um, still open, um, perhaps uh, Chetan, you could answer the question from Taiyang Zong. Uh, is it possible for small city or town to see food remittances from the rural to the urban? And I know this is something interesting that Jonathan has spoken about um, in the um, Southern African context. Chetan, is that something that's evident in the Indian context? I mean, uh, you know, uh, is it possible? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, and, you know, as you said that, you know, there is evidence in Africa that food remittances are significant. In India, perhaps there's some amount of food transfer to urban migrants from uh, their rural households, but we don't really have any evidence on this. But I suppose it's not as significant as, uh, you know, in, uh, as say in Africa, given that land holdings in, in India are very small. And as I said, that small, you know, uh, most of the smallholder farmers uh, or smallholder households uh, are net food buyers, but again, this is a question you know that uh, that needs investigation, and you know we'll try and capture it in our in our in our field-based study uh, mm -hmm. going forward. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure whether to answer answer the question in the chat box uh, because I tried answering, I started answering one, but then there was a suggestion that we wait till the end. So you know, there's also another question I think by Sujata. Uh, do you want me to take that? Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead and do that. I think that that's on the right to food um, uh, legislation and, um, you know, what does that mean for food security? So, so, so I think the recognition of the right to food is, is certainly a welcome step. Uh, uh, the problem, though, is that the food entitlements in India are linked to domicile status. So, and because most uh, migration is circular and most rural urban migrants have the permanent residence in rural area, they often miss out on these entitlements in cities. Uh, uh, but some Indian states have in recent years uh, uh, started uh, food canteens, subsidized food canteens where migrants can access cheap meals. There's also work being done on making food entitlements portable for poor migrants to 
you know, excess uh, food rations in the urban destination. But, you know, this also has its challenges because, because not all members of the household migrate to cities. Some stay in rural area. How do you really split the entitlements uh, between, you know, rural and urban areas? Uh, and also, and I think this is something that was uh, Rajan mentioned yesterday, that in India, I think policymakers have tended to take a very negative view of migration. They think that migration is all bad. Migration is all distress driven, and not, um, you know, not really a part of livelihood strategy. You know, often dynamic livelihood strategy and deliberate livelihood strategies of of, of rural households. And then also you have this sort of another smart city agenda, um, you know, which includes everything, um, you know, digitization, internet, and everything. But you know. Uh, but these basic, uh, you know, uh, basic issues such as food security, for, or you know, so 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 I think I think there's a lot uh, that needs to be, um, you know, that needs to be done. Yeah, thank you. I'll stop for in the interest of time. Uh, just Mark, I, I, just Mark. to follow up, yeah, just to follow up on that. It's very interesting, and I think it would be use. It would be interesting to compare and contrast this context in India in terms of domicile and circular migration with the huku system in China in terms of who has access to rights to, to be a resident, to access whatever kind of below poverty line services there may be. So that, that's an interesting question. Rajan, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, you know, I think I think we need some research even on this, uh, the recently announced government policy, one country, one race and card which talks about only the food distribution. I think some states are trying out, Kerala is trying out. I don't know how successful it is. I think this is time to evaluate this particular scheme in India probably and recommend to the government because this can directly feed into policy. Yeah, they are talking about that right now. In fact, one of the migrant told, you will talk, you, you are all talking about us when there was COVID. Now COVID is getting over, now you will forget us. I think to, you know, we should not forget the migrants now because the COVID is getting over. We should continue to debate on this food security, looking at policies which is emerging and how it can be corrected, it can be reworked, and plus more research required on this subject. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. So we still have a few minutes. If anybody in the audience wants to pose a question, please raise your hand or, or post it um, in the Q&A. Um, meanwhile, maybe I could pose a question to Chand. I, I was interested as you were presenting the idea of uh, food, um, care chains um i mean do how is there a way in which we can connect this with the sustainable livelihoods sort of agenda i mean it was more of a more of a development focused idea but we're looking at almost transnational kind of livelihood practices now in terms of the utilization of migrant networks for for women and so I wonder if that, that's something that you have um, thought about in terms of uh, what, what does it mean for ideas of development and, and livelihood? Yeah, thank you, Margaret, for that um, suggestion. And I mean, I, I've not thought of linking it to the, to the sustainable uh, development goals, but um, I can definitely um, consider that as I work on and revise the paper, because I think that will make a stronger uh, case, uh, particularly because these this is labor migration for development. These are agents of development. Um, and uh, and yeah, this care chain kind of emphasizes the transnational aspect to this. So um, yeah, so thank you for that suggestion. Thanks. And, and Jonathan, there is a question for Godfrey, and sadly Godfrey can't be with us right now, but you would answer it. Uh, it's uh, by Anil, who's saying, can you give us some insights on the current status of migrant deportation? You're muted, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody yeah, had I mean, to do it. Somebody yeah. had to do it. Deportations. Um, have uh, they sort of peaked about uh, 10 years ago and they've been declining ever since and that does raise a question about why this might be it certainly doesn't relate to um, a decline in the numbers of uh, of migrants um, it's generally thought that it's an expensive uh, no-win policy for the state particularly in the region where a revolving door 
uh, migration is uh, is very common. So um, by that I mean people being deported and immediately coming back uh, into into South Africa because the borders are so very uh, porous. And so I mean other strategies are necessary in order to make South Africa uh, what we call undesirable uh, state uh, destination. And in that context, uh, what Godfrey's had to say, I think is quite important. Uh, because um, without being too instrumentalist about it, there, there's, there's clearly uh, a vested interest in making conditions as uncomfortable as possible for migrants and uh, potential migrants coming to the country. And that sort of disincentivizes any attempt to really take uh, action against, uh, against xenophobia. Okay, hey, thank you for that, Jonathan. Well, we are at 9.45 and I would like to thank all of our panelists for being so efficient to keeping on time and for sharing their wonderful presentations. Um, I apologize that we didn't have more time for Q&A, but you can certainly continue to ask your questions in the Q&A box. And I know that our panelists will be happy to respond to you. So I hope you'll all join me in thanking the panelists and using whatever kind of... Uh, um, responses you would like to in the in the zoom world that we are thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you Margaret. thank you margaret thank you bye-bye jonathan you can move to the next session in releasing kavita to yeah yeah i'm just waiting for uh kavita to join us she joined already. I can uh, see she's it. joined us. There she is. Okay. That's uh, been a long great. time back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I uh, would like to uh, introduce our uh, keynote speaker. I'm delighted uh, to do so. It's Professor Kavita Data, who is Professor of Development Geography and Head of the School at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, she's also a deputy vice principal and director of the Queen Mary Center for the Study of Migration. Uh, Professor Data holds a BA from the University of Botswana and a PhD from Cambridge University. Uh, beginning with her pioneering work on gender and migration in Botswana in the 1990s, Professor Data has made a major contribution to both development geography and migration studies. Uh, contributing to critical understandings of transnational migration, the financialization, and migrants' financial practices. Uh, these interests have been developed in a series of projects investigating the intersections between transnational migration and the shifting nature, politics, and sensibility of work in global cities, migrants' everyday remittance, debt, inheritance, and charitable practices, the financialization of remittance intermediaries and financial inclusion, and the increased significance of digital finance in migrants' lives. The recent publications include the book-length study, Migrants and Their Money, Surviving Financial Exclusion in London, published by Policy Press and University of Chicago Press. And she's also the co-author of Global Cities at Work, Migrant Labor in an Uneven World, published by Pluto Press. So we're very honored uh, to have such a distinguished researcher and scholar to give the keynote address at this conference and looking forward very much to hearing uh, about her current research on migration and food insecurity in the UK. And the title of her talk is Scarcity Amongst Abundance, Food Insecurity and Provisioning Among UK Migrants Communities, sorry, UK Migrant Communities During COVID-19. Uh, after um, Professor Data has presented, uh, we should uh, have a few minutes for Q&A uh, before we move to the final panel of the conference. So uh, over to you, uh, Professor Data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for those very, very kind words and for the invitation to speak both to you and, 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 and to Rajan. I'm really delighted to be here. And I followed the work of your respective networks with a great deal of interest. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, I should be able to start it from the beginning. Can we all see that? Great. So 
So I'm really, I'm, I'm very sorry that I missed um, the fantastic sessions that you had yesterday and I was able to join today for, 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 the, for, for your, your first panel. My talk today is um, based on a collaborative project connecting during COVID, which has been undertaken with my colleagues who are based at Queen Mary with me, but also at the University College of London, UCL, and um, SOAS, Oriental and African Studies. And it's a project that has entailed research with Indian, Brazilian, and Somali migrant communities living in London, Glasgow, and Cardiff. And what I'd like to do and what follows is really sort of detail, if you like, the intersections between food insecurity, migration, and the COVID-19 pandemic, tell you a little bit more about the research project, um, to share some of our empirical findings um, before coming to some concluding reflections. But to start with, um, I thought it might be instructive to really pull out three key lines of inquiry or argument, which I think are of wider relevance and perhaps of interest um, to the audience here. So the first of these is, is, is really an argument that to better understand everyday lived experiences of migrant food poverty, we need to adopt political economy perspectives which are cognizant of broader structural and systemic processes which range from anti-migrant hostility to labor market exclusions and housing precarity. Now you could argue quite you know, uh, uh, cogently that a political economy approach in itself is not new in either critical migration studies or critical food studies. But I would suggest that at this particular moment in time, there are two caveats to this. A, that in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in particular to challenge the presentism of the crisis lens, political economy approaches need to be situated within longer term and multispatial vulnerabilities. So they need to be attentive to context, they need to be attentive to a history of food insecurity, but also the spatialities of food insecurity and migration. And B, that such politically and economically informed understandings need to feed into policy responses to food insecurity and migration. To date, I would argue that policy is premised on very narrowly focused empiricist evidence where food poverty is constructed as a personal fa uh, failure, it's ascribed to individual behavioral um, practices such that wider structural and social relations, so what we refer to as the governmentality and the biopolitics of hunger um, are, are, are largely sort of um, bypassed. So we need to be attentive to those in, in, in the current moment. So that's the first set of arguments. The second I would say is that there's an urgent and continued need to bridge what are often analytically separate scholarships on food insecurity and food provisioning. And here, and perhaps it's of no sort of, uh, it's not a surprise given that I am a geographer, I think that scalar um, initiatives which emerged during the pandemic are particularly instructive in that they encompass both individual and community um, organization responses to food insecurity. And I think it's also important to bridge this kind of um, divide between food insecurity and food provisioning kind of research and literatures in that it allows us to illustrate dynam dynamic and complex migrant subjectivities so that migrants are both recipients but also providers, they're benefactors as well as supplicants. So we can switch between different sort of migrant positionalities. And third really is the significance of relational and transnational understandings to migrant food insecurity. I think that is really when you're often asked the question, what is specific to migrant communities? How are they different from? I think it is that relational and transnational perspective that really allows us to elaborate upon the fact that the insecurities that are faced by individuals and, 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 and communities and the provisioning that they undertake are shaped by those that they are connected to um, across transnational space. And Chand, your, your presentation really spoke to that. But let me sort of go step back a little bit and set the context. So there is never a good time for a pandemic, but the UN warned in early 2020 that the coronavirus had pushed the world, including the UK and the countries that we're interested in in our project to the precipice of a hunger pandemic. So globally, COVID-19 added a further 60 million people to an already significant pre-pandemic undernourished population. And in richer countries like the UK, it arrived on the heels of over a decade of austerity, whereby already high levels of food poverty were further exacerbated. And this was illustrated very graphically in, in, in the early year of the, of, of, of the pandemic in 2020 by a heavier reliance on food banks. Now, these trends have been explained in the UK context in relation to two sort of, if you like, um, processes. The first was the intensification of existing challenges and particularly those that were related to economic stress. So the loss of jobs, reduced income, sharp decline in disposable incomes. 
but also the emergence of new challenges. So these new challenges were disruptions to supply chains, um, the subsequent food price increases, which further sort of limited people's access to, to, to food. And in the UK, where we import as much as 50% of the food that we consume, it was unclear, at least in the early days of the pandemic, whether these disruptions were due to Brexit, which had been very hastily concluded just before the pandemic. Um, so was it because of Brexit? Was it because of the pandemic? Or was it because of both? Undoubtedly, however, what the pandemic did do was shine a very uncomfortable light on what Giza called the inequalities that are by no means new, but exacerbated truths that can no longer be ignored. Now, arguably a truth that has been ignored um, is the predicament of migrant communities living in richer economies who emerge as something as an afterthought in debates on food insecurity and the pandemic. And this illusion, I would argue, is attributable to a number of interlinked factors. Preeminent is that there is, is the remarkably interdisciplinary scholarship on food um, and migration, which have only recently intersected. As Alonso and her colleagues argue, rather than a dearth of research, scholarship on both food and scholarship on migration is scattered across different disciplines, ranging from the humanities to the social sciences, the physical and the medical sciences, and encompassing very many different topics and types of research, so that we begin to see a, a, a fragmentation. And illustrating this divorce between migration and food security scholarship, Jonathan, your work with, um, with CESA and this really fantastic quote really en encapsulate that it, is, that it is as if nobody moves in the world of international food security and nobody eats in the world of global migration and development. And yet, as we know, um, as scholars who work in this field, migration transforms food pathways, both in places of origin and destination from what is eaten, where it is eaten, how it is prepared and broader food cultures and environments. I would argue that this fragmentation is entrenched further by geographically distinctive emphasis of um, work in rich and poorer parts of the world. So hunger and malnutrition garner the most interest um, in, in academic and policy attention in the global south. And where this has coincided with an interest in migration, the focus has been on, on, turn, in, on internal rural to urban migration, where food insecurity is identified as a driver of mobility. Other work has interrogated how migration and the remittances generated through it might alleviate food insecurity in home communities. And indeed the immediate concern both globally and nationally with regards to the pandemic was how it might disrupt remittance flows. And with predictions of an unprecedented decline of 20%, which is equivalent to roughly 100 billion US dollars, policymakers stress the importance of keeping remittance moving so as to avert a food disaster in recipient households where remittances are recognized as being spent on food. Yet as researchers were also uncovering, food insecurity among migrants was also widespread. So in turn, in the global north, what you see in terms of research is almost a double movement. On the one hand, you have migrant-specific research on food cultures, and this is linked to emotional and affective economies, questions of identity formation, acculturation, hybridization, as well as research on the dynamics of migrant labor in food economies. So that, uh, that work on food does relate to migrants. On the other hand, where food insecurity is explored and there's a rich body of work on austerity driven hunger and responses to this by food banks, migrants are not necessarily an explicit focus, although asylum seekers have received um, some attention. I think more broadly, international migrants in particular are often positioned as resilient, as development heroes, as stalwart remitters, even in times of crisis. And in this context, their vulnerabilities and especially those which relate to food remain largely um, uninterrogated. Now, if I bring the, our attention to the UK, while insights um, into food insecurity amongst UK migrant communities is partial, scholars propose that this, these, this is likely to be significant, not least because of the overlap between these populations and other at-risk groups, including those on low wages and racialized and minoritized um, populations. And these vulnerabilities have undoubtedly intensified over 30 years of a hostile migrant um, environment, which is a key feature of, of austerity has bedded down. We've had 30 years of immigration reform um, and the specific institutionalization of the hostile environment in 2012, which reflects the considerable lengths that successive UK governments have gone to to make life as difficult as possible, not only for undocumented migrants, but also increasingly for documented migrants and their families. And some of this is, is, is reflected in the new no recourse to public funds immigration control measure whereby roughly about 1.3 million people um, are, are not able to call upon the, the, the state um, when they're in, 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 in at, at, at points of sort of, if you like, um, of challenge. 
Moving on then quickly to really think about food provisioning in a more broader sense. Um, food provisioning, I think is the, the focus on provisioning is important because it bridges that analytical gap between sites of surplus, which are food production, and those in need of food, so food consumption. Um, and again, if we're looking at just Global North kind of research, then provisioning is very often understood through the lens of the food bank. And there's very interesting work, like I said, on food banks as key sites of encounters, how these can become spaces of care, but also increasingly also how food banks operate as spaces of stigma and, and spaces of shame. I think what becomes evident when you're engaging with migrant communities is that relatively few, especially minoritized groups who experience food insecurity, actually access food banks. And for those reasons, we really need to think about a, have a broad broader perspective on what um, on, on what food um, um, provisioning actually looks like within migrant communities and at times of crisis. And in this context, we've really been engaging with the, with, with work on, on how access to food is engineered um, through both people, through networks, and through the, the, the creation of sort of pop-up um, crisis food infrastructures, which I'll return to in a minute. So just very, very briefly, um, because I'm conscious of time, the project that I'm talking about, like I said, is connecting during COVID and it was, um, the full title is looking at practices of care, remittance sending and digitization amongst UK migrant communities. It was funded by the UK's Economic and Social Research Council with three major ambitions really to map crisis, stroke resilient remittance trajectories, to explore migrant well-being and practices of care, and to look at the digitization of social and financial relations. And what we've done through over the last 18 months is two online surveys, in-depth interviews with, with, with migrants, in-depth interviews with migrant um, remittance agencies, um, community spotlight workshops, um, and focus group discussions. We were interested in looking at both new and old uh, migrant communities, the old being the Somali and the Indian migrant communities, when, which are now multi-generational uh, migrant communities and diasporic communities within the UK, but also at a new, relatively new uh, migrant community, which was the Brazilian, and also to spread the focus away from London, so to look at other, uh, other UK cities of, of Glasgow and Cardiff. So here, just really very briefly, an overview of the communities, and this is just taken from the first survey, and I guess the important sort of um, data that is presented here is in relation to deprivation and the extent to which we had significant levels of deprivation in the communities that we, that we interviewed, including a specific mention of food insecurity as one of the deprivations and vulnerabilities that was associated with the pandemic. So taking you quickly through sort of the time spaces of food insecurity uh, amongst uh, migrant communities and, and, and the key groups that emerged as being at risk of food insecurity within our, within our research were the undocumented, perhaps unsurprising, single mothers, again, unsurprising, but perhaps one that we weren't anticipating was the number of international students who also fell within this, within this, um, within this category. We also encountered a continuum of insecurity, which ranged from the mild to the severe, um, so that you had people who were talking about not having access to food or worried about access to food, reducing the quantity of food they were eating, but also skipping meals to outright experiences of hunger. I think what was very important, and this is again goes back to broader debates around food insecurities, understanding the significance of cultural food insecurities and the extent to food which food insecurity is experienced because what people are receiving as food or are able to access as food, they do not recognize as food. So this was particularly articulated by international students who we interviewed and one of whom said to us, we were not brought up to eat any kind of food. And so this kind of sense of cultural food insecurity. The time frames when we start to think about it, remember I was making that argument about the political economy and sort of thinking more longer term in this, the three time frames that emerged as being particularly significant in, in, in the narratives that we heard on food insecurity were pre-migration, pre-pandemic and pandemic temporalities. So we heard about the insecurities that existed and the fact that food insecurity is a driver for migration but also that the, the food insecurities are produced through and by particularly debt financed migration. So migrants are, and, 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 and to some extent, the extent to which pre-pandemic food insecurities existed and some of the migrants themselves articulated how they encountered these as some, as, as, or, or how they experienced this as, as something of a surprise because they felt alongside many of their families and networks that they were migrating to a very rich country. So this kind of sense that they could be, they could be hungry in a rich country came as a, as, as, as a complete shock. 
I think what was also interesting, and this was partly because of the provisioning, some of the participants reported eating better during the pandemic. And this was because they could actually, for the first time, access um, food provisioning initiatives. But I think what's important when we start to think about temporality is that the relationship between food insecurity and food security is not linear, and that it fluctuates between one to the other according to changing circumstances. Thinking then about sort of this, uh, the, the, the spatial um, sort of um, aspects and, uh, and how food insecurity is spatially produced and reproduced, um, I think it's really important to recognize the extreme overcrowding in the private rental market in the UK as in elsewhere. The worst case that we came across was an international student who lived with 26 other people. We had couples with young children who found it very difficult to secure even crowded accommodation as landlords preferred to rent rooms to single people. And where landlords were co-resident, it was not uncommon that restrictions on the use of gas or cooking facilities were imposed. And in almost all cases, people were sharing with strangers who were more or less observant of lockdowns, wearing masks, hand sanitizing, and so on, which led to a great deal of stress um, and anxiety over using shared um, cooking facilities. So you lived in a room, but you shared the cooking facilities. And that really, the spatial sort of context really produced um, um, a, lot of a, a lot of anxiety. The attention to space also takes us to debates on what Marvoli, et cetera, and her colleagues refer to as everyday forms of commensality and conviviality. And again, we know that within the food cultures literature, there's a lot of interest in this and the extent to which eating together has really positive connotations in terms of redressing loneliness, isolation, resulting in the con consumption of more nutritious food, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think the point that I wanted to make very quickly is that for migrants who are living in this really crowded accommodation, they live in almost semi-public spaces. And here, the, 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 the ability to create commensality and conviviality is really striking in its absence. And we were particularly struck by one of the, the, the interviews that we did with an Indian woman who talked about cooking very quickly and then rushing and taking the food upstairs to a small room, which she shared with her husband and two children, and they sat on the floor. And, and, I, and, and, and to me, this is where eating is almost a surreptitious and I imagine almost a silent act. So it's, it's, it's about a, a striking absence of commensality within that. So thinking then in terms of sort of scale the geographies of provisioning, and I'm sorry, I'm rushing you through all of this, but here what we really uncovered during the pandemic was a, a, a range of different sort of initiatives, which, 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 which went from individual foraging. So this was about, you know, a, a father talking about how he couldn't stay at home and used to walk the streets looking for food or looking for, for, for somewhere where he could access food to community initiatives. And here, this is where multi-generational communities become really important. So the Somalis could actually count upon second, third, and now even fourth generation family members and clan members who could be called upon to do the shopping, to do the cooking and to do the redistribution of, of food. We really see, and here in the Indian community, the significance of diaspora populations and supporting migrant populations when they are experiencing um, uh, um, uh, uh, shortages of food, but also about the creation of different kinds of provisioning. So really the, the formation of communal kitchens, of shared practices, of, of, of coming together um, and, 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 and therefore taking away some of that stigma that is associated with the receive, rec receiving of food aid. Um, and move on then to really look at transnational anxieties and so thinking about um, the, the, the third aspect of, of what I wanted to talk about in terms of relational and transnational aspects of food insecurity. Um, and this was really graphically presented to us by a Somali pensioner who we interviewed who was talking about remittances and he said that if we send less, they eat less and it is as, as, as sort of um, uh, as, as, you know, uh, basic as that. I think it's important to recognize that our research project unfolded, unfolded in the context of a geographically varied epidemic, which peaked in the UK, then in India with the Delta variant, then in Brazil with Bolsonaro and all his posturing, and then back in the UK. So you had this constant kind of traffic in anxiety and stress between these different, different communities. We see a vital link between remittances and everyday survival. I think this is most graphically illustrated in the, in, in, in the Somali word, which is for, for remittances, which is bill which is adapted from the English bill um, so that you know, remittances are really spent on bills, on rent and on food. Um, we saw this in crisis remittances in terms of the relational and transnational aspects um, and a varied picture, picture of crisis remittances so that while the average amount remitted declined, the number sending money back home increased during the pandemic with some variation across the three communities. 
So to conclude, um, um, I think what I'd like to sort of point out in the conclusion is that migrant specific perspectives unveil very different dimensions of food insecurity and food provisioning during crisis. And so by focusing on migrants, we get a sort of a different kind of a, a, a view of what food insecurity and food provisioning. I'd go back to the point that it's important to have critically informed political economy approaches to food insecurity and provisioning. We need to bridge this divide between hunger and between aid um, and to think about them in, 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 in conversation with each other, in dialogue with each other, and to really be attentive to the relational and transnational um, understandings of, of, of food insecurity and food provisioning. And of course, always to constantly challenge that idea of crisis, and, and crisis is something that is um, exceptional and that doesn't happen with what we've witnessed in recent years is mutating crisis. And in the UK, we've gone from COVID very rapidly to a cost of living and to a political crisis. Um, and so a crisis lens only affords us that much of a view, whereas we, are new, we need to be a lot more holistic. So thank you very much. And I hope I'm not too much over time, Jonathan. No, not at all, uh, Kavita. Thanks so much for that fascinating uh, talk and insights and, and kind of unpicking these global um, uh, statistics about the impact of the pandemic on food security uh, at, the, at the ground level. Um, we've got about uh, five minutes. It's, it's quite possible for us to just move uh, from this uh, session to, to the last one without a break. So why don't we do that and have about five minutes of discussion, if that's okay uh, with you. Um, perhaps I could just uh, kick it off by uh, just asking you a question about the kind of spatiality of migrant um, experience of uh, food insecurity. You know, um, I was struck as you were talking um about uh this concept of the food desert that originated in the uk mm. seems to have fallen out of fashion in the uk and it has really been taken up um with 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 um kind of statistical precision at least in uh, in in the us north america uh, mm. more generally mm. um I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in relation to this. I mean, should we re reintroduce this idea in, in the UK context, perhaps modifying it slightly to talk about, uh, you know, migrant food deserts instead of just urban uh, food deserts? What are your thoughts about that? Thanks, Jonathan. And that's a really um, important and interesting question, because like you, we've noted the extent to which food deserts, that's not a concept that's really referred to in the food insecurities literature in the UK. And I think that where it did come up in our research was essentially and, and was really in relation to that idea of cultural food deserts. So when we were talking to international students, for example, who were living in Glasgow, the points that they made to us about, about not having access to food was not so much that they couldn't go to supermarkets, but they couldn't go to supermarkets that sold their food, that sold Indian food in their, in, in their context. For that, they had to travel to a neighboring town which had a larger supermarket, which had that Asian aisle, or where they had to travel to other towns where you had Asian shopkeepers. So the idea of a cultural food desert certainly does exist. And the same happened with the Somali communities who said, well, we could during the days of the pandemic lockdowns, et cetera, we could access the mainstream supermarkets, but that meant that we couldn't necessarily because there was much stricter imposition on the smaller providers who were then providing you with culturally appropriate food. And we couldn't access that. So I think there really is currency in actually thinking about cultural food deserts and thinking about the provisioning of food, of, 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 of cultural foods, which is much more um, geographically spread um, than it is in mainstream. Um, I was thinking about something else about the, the work that I was doing and that I am also doing currently with Zimbabwean uh, migrants who also talk about this kind of food deserts in the, in, in the same kind of way. So I think that's a really important point. Yeah, thanks so very much. I have a question here from uh, from Chan uh, in relation to um, the relational transnational anxieties. And she asked, was there an acute awareness by migrants of price hikes back home in mm. terms of items like cooking oil, rice, and so on? And yeah. did this affect their remittance sending? Yeah. 
That was really, Chan, that was really interesting and at times sort of contradictory conversations that we had around relational and transnational anxieties. So many of them talked about the fact that, you know, their families back home knew about their, the situation they were in, they knew about their family situations and so demands for, and particularly in the Somali community, a lot of the remittance literature is really structured around this kind of expectation of, of remittances that the demands or expectations really went down as, 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 as a result of that. So there was a great deal of, they were, there was more, more of our discussion was about an awareness about how the pandemic was peaking in different areas. So when we were talking to Indian migrants during the time of the Delta variant, it was really around, you know, not having access to oxygen, being involved in, 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 in community kind of initiatives to send uh, money back. Um, so there was less discussion really around food price hikes um, amongst the Indian community, amongst the Somali community, there was still a really prevalent sense that if they did not send money back, then people would not be able to afford to eat. And here, the, it was also that the pandemic had just been preceded by a drought. And so food prices were already on the increase. So there, there was a much more sort of um, uh, discussion around sort of food price hikes. And amongst the Brazilians, really, um, a, a sense of, of, of real political disarray in Brazil. Um, there's a lot of anti-Bolsonaro migrants um, in the UK, Brazilian migrants in the UK, and, and a lot of that was articulated in the sense of the mismanagement of the pandemic back home and the mismanagement of information about how the pandemic spread, et cetera. So it was uh, the discussions about the relationality were kind of quite disparate. It was around anxiety. It was around stress. It was about specific things like price food increases, about remittances, about politics, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rajan, uh, carry on. Yeah, I just need, uh, you know, I think thank you very much Avida, for this uh, wonderful presentation. I have basically one to, you know, this community kitchen, which we were handling in Kerala, you know, that in yes. the first phase of COVID-19, because I was part of the government to advise them. <laughs> and uh, I think I would like to know that, you know, you also put about something on kitchen. I would like to know a little bit, little bit detail about that. Yeah. The good thing is very important is the diaspora role during COVID-19. I think, yeah. you know, we are trying to slowly document that. In fact, trying to help even bring dead bodies from Gulf countries, which I know, and yeah. distributing food and also arranging special flights uh, mm -hmm. to come back to in the one day Bharat flight. So, mm -hmm. you know, like as long as I saw the diaspora played a role. And also there is a diaspora also has a different issues in, in, in the Gulf. For example, there are Malayali diaspora, there are Tamil diaspora. Mm -hmm. UK also diaspora has certain uh, certain people are more certain states people like Punjab or Gujarat mm -hmm. or you know. Mm -hmm. So I think how these were playing that time, you know, is, it was anything, you know. Of course, I saw some people are they don't talk the general things. You know, mm -hmm. diaspora means you don't worry about is from which which part of the place or is which religion. Some mm -hmm. people do look at that. You know, yeah. I think I think something you know if you have any bias, mm -hmm. I diaspora, you know, something which I'm I'm you know I'm very keen on uh, you know looking at it. You know, in fact, I would like to. Look at it, you know, I will write to you separately, but I think it's something important of the diaspora role. You yeah. know, I think that's something if you can comment on that, that's it. That's it from my side. Okay. Thanks, Raj. So if I start with the diaspora role, I think what we encountered was really the sense that there were many Indias in India, lots of little Indias in India. So this sense of sort of disaggregation according to the state that you came from, the language, the religion, etc. But what was interesting, so two aspects of that, the one was with in to the extent to which religious differences were, were overcome during the, or you, you stepped over religious differences. And we really found this in Glasgow, where a Gurdwara that always offered langar on a Sunday started to see new people coming into the Gurdwara trying to access the food. They quickly sussed out that these were students. And so they started to provide them with food, but then they also reached out to the community outside of them. So it, this was not only Indians, but they also reached out to Pakistani, Romanian communities that were outside and, and started to provide food parcels to these, to these communities. So it was really about recognizing a need within your own community or seeing it, but then stepping across um, um, two, different, um, two different communities. A similar thing that you could see in Scotland, which is a smaller, obviously, Asian community, is that the older settled community saw international students who were really in distress, who did not have enough food to eat, who couldn't get out of their hostels, who couldn't get to supermarkets, etc. And here you see the importance of digital connection. So they created WhatsApp groups. So there was initially a conversation between two people, and suddenly it became a huge WhatsApp group where the diaspora was saying, well, what do you need? The students were articulating the needs. The diaspora community members were then collecting the food and leaving these food parcels in hostels for these students to, to, to pick up. So you really get that sense of sort of connection and disconnection. But also then amongst some of the diaspora 
people that, you know, these, these newcomers are sort of taking things that they are not entitled to. So it wasn't always a sort of, you know, romanticized rosy picture, but certainly in the peak time of the, of the, of the crisis, the diaspora, would, you would almost say they were first responders before the state, both the local and the central state got involved. In terms of the community kitchens, this is a really interesting example. So these are kind of um, an alternative to food banks. Access to food banks in the UK is very strongly sort of heavily gate-kept or, or uh, you know, you need to be referred to a food bank. Most migrants do not know that they can be referred to a food bank, so they wouldn't even try and access a food bank. The few that we encountered during our research who had done, went to the food bank and then looked at the food and thought, well, I don't really recognize this as food and didn't know what to do with it. And so the community kitchens are really important and interesting. And again, we see these are more evident in the longer settled community. So the one that we really encounter, we, we worked with closely was operated by a Somali woman um, where they had um, sort of communal kitchen, uh, cooking, which was really important because you had these women who felt like Somali women who felt like they could now give something back. They could teach other people who came there how to cook Somali food, etc. They also operated a pantry. Initially, they only accepted halal food because they were catering for the Muslim community, but then they started getting donations which were haram food as well, and they realized that there was a need in the community, and so they set up a separate pantry which was non-halal. And so again, they were opening up their sort of doors to, to non-Muslim um, um, uh, users as well. So I think it is really important because, and, and, and really a lot of that discussion was how previous to the pandemic, Somalis would never go to a food bank. They would never say, I need. So the pandemic in a way allowed you to articulate a need and it took the shame out of that need because everybody was on the same thing. But then also to participate in these kinds of more diverse provisioning um, uh, initiatives, which I think are more attentive to commensality, conviviality, and the effective dimensions of food, sort of emotional sustenance, etc. Yeah, one more thing along with that, uh, Kavita, the point is that the students, for example, I personally believe the current students are future workers in UK. Most of yes. them never come back. I know 80% Indians who come as students, they never come back to India. Yes. This is true to Canada too. But yeah. then the universities which were, you know, getting a lot of money in terms of fees, I, I, you know, I was visited during, you know, COVID time. I was there a few months back. I think the university could not do much for the students. No. I think they yeah. failed. I think I, you know, like, it's like they are using them as a milk cows to get uh, funding in universities. Yeah. I think it's something uh, you felt also during that period, universities are not coming out. And, and some students told me they were starving. They, they don't yeah. know, especially students who came in and they don't yeah. know there was no class online. I think I think the way the students were treated by the student, there was no community thing like that. At least the no. new students, you know, yeah. I think something miserably, I think we all failed in yeah. providing basic food for the new students. I, and yeah. university failed. Personally, uh -huh. you know, we talk about that, you know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with that. I think universities did fail. And I think the fact that they failed at a community that is so important to the survival of British universities is particularly shameful. And I think what is also important in terms of just looking forward then is that that insecurity has not disappeared at the end of the pandemic. So in a, a follow on project that I'm doing with one of the local boroughs in, in, in East London is looking at food insecurity amongst international students because the cost of living crisis is, 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 is putting them in a, in a precarious position as well. So we are not seeing an end of students turning up at food banks, et cetera, or looking for food aid. It's actually increasing. So it shows you, and I think, but some of it also arises, Rajan, I think from a misperception that international students come from rich families. Whereas what we found through the pandemic was a really graphical illustration that international students come from a very mixed background and many of them come on the assumption that they can work. And when there is a pandemic and you can't work, yeah. The precarity is that you know within two weeks you've run out of money and you and 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 what do you do? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Kavita, I'm very reluctantly going to have to draw this uh, to a close. I know you have another engagement as well. Um, thank you so much for this. I mean, uh, we we run these monthly uh, my food uh, network webinars and it would be great if we could invite you to come back and uh, talk at greater length about this and have a, a longer discussion with us because you've raised an enormous number of really interesting um, issues that are not just relevant to to migrants in the UK but you know migrants uh, everywhere really 
Um, so thanks again uh, very much for agreeing to do this. It's uh, It's been great to have you and um, we'll uh, look forward to engaging with you in the future. Thanks so much. Definitely. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kavita. Uh, I think we'll go uh, straight to the final uh, panel. Um, and uh, I, I think Sujata is going to be uh, chairing this final panel. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Sujata Ramachandran, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow with the My Food Project and the Hungry City Partnership with the Balsili School of International Affairs and Wilfred Laurie University. I'd like to welcome you to the final session of the conference on food security and migrants on the move. This conference has been jointly organized by the International Institute for Migration and Development, EMAD in Kerala, India, the My Food Network of the Hungry Cities Partnership with the Balsili School and the International Migration Research Center or IMRC uh, the theme of our final session is rural urban linkages and food security. I believe we may have four presenters. Each presenter will speak for about 15 minutes. And after the presentations are completed, we'll have a question and answer segment. You are welcome to use the Q&A function to ask your questions while the presentations are taking place. And I shall ask the questions on your behalf after the presentation. Um, our first speaker is Zhenzhong Shi. Zhenzhong is the project research manager of the My Food Project. His research investigates the dynamics of urban food systems in Nanjing, China, with a particular focus on the role of wet markets in urban food security, household food security, and policies for food provisioning. Zhenzhong leads the Shirk funded project on COVID-19's impact on food security in China and the other CIHR funded project on assessing and mitigating impacts of COVID-19 on food security in marginalized communities in Canada, South Africa, and Ecuador. Uh, his presentation, which, which is with Professor Tayang Zhong of Nanjing University is titled, The Role of Rural Urban Migrants in Urban Food Systems in China. Over to you, Zhenzhong. Thank you, Sujana, for that introduction. Um, let's uh, migrate temporarily to China. And uh, today, I'm like, I'd like to use this opportunity to talk uh, about uh, the work we've been doing with the Hungry Cities Partnership um, on the various roles of rural urban migrants um, in urban food systems in China. So uh, we know that China, uh, in terms of migration, is a major sending country. So it has much uh, less uh, international migrants registered in the country. So uh, that's why we focus mainly on this research on uh, domestic migrants from uh, the rural area to urban centers. Um, I acknowledge that this work was led by Professor Taiyang Zhong from Nanjing University, who is also with us uh, today. I will do the presentation, but uh, he could join us in the Q&A. So before we look at the various roles of um, uh, migrants in urban food systems, I think it's important to highlight uh, the, the major kind of institutional uh, settings um, that dictates how migrants are engaging with urban life and also with urban food system, uh, which is the so-called urban rural dual system, uh, which established after the after the founding of the PRC in 1949. The purpose was really to facilitate capital accumulation in cities for rapid industrial development. Um, and through the establishment of uh, the hukou system, uh, Margaret uh, mentioned that um, briefly in the previous session. Um, so this is a household registration system that uh, give people different kind of registration status. Um, they divided the population to two groups. So one is uh, the population with urban registration and the other is the rural with a rural registration. Um, with the different kind of household registration, you will have a very different access to social welfare, education, job opportunities, med medical care, and even food supply. 
So for a long time, you know, throughout the decades after the establishment of the system, it is so deeply entrenched and created an urban-rural divide. And the divide has evolved from a spatial differentiation into a systematic distinction in the economic structure, social norms, and cultural traits between the urban and, and the rural. Um, so as a result, there, it has led to you know, segregation between these two groups of people and also creates various kinds of barriers and challenges for uh, the rural population, such as inequality, um, discrimination, and also their low economic and social status. Um, things started to change in 1984, you know, when the government uh, started to allow the migration of rural labor to find jobs in cities. And uh, since then, the number of migrants, rural urban migrants, uh, started to grow exponentially. And it accelerated in the 1990s and 2000, 2000s. And there is more and more people working in non-farming jobs in cities, but they still keep their, their farmland back in their hometown in the rural area. So there, this, this, this kind of discrepancy between their, their, their identity uh, in, as a farmer uh, and also the urban life uh, creates a lot of problems, uh, especially for the long-term kind of development goals of the government. So in the 2010s, the government recognized that this problem and the need to address, uh, you know, the integration of migrants, the issue of integration of migrants into, into cities, into urban life. So more and more cities starts to abolish uh, their prohibitive policies that prevent rural migrants from getting an urban hukou. And um, throughout the decades, we've seen some interesting changes in terms of the characteristics of migrant workers. Um, so you can see from this uh, diagram that the total number of migrant workers um, starts to uh, still increases in, out the, in, in the past decade. However, their year on year growth uh, rates started to decline since the 2010 as the population of China is aging. Um, and uh, we see some very interesting changes among, among the different generations of, of migrants. Um, so the younger generation of migrants, um, uh, especially migrants who were born in the 1990s and 2000s, they tend to more likely work in the service sector, um, uh, especially as food delivery, uh, as food delivery drivers uh, in Chinese cities, which is becoming uh, more and more popular. I will talk about this later. While the older generation, the first generation of migrant workers, they tend to work in the construction, on construction sites and in the manufacturing sector. So there has been an increasing integration uh, of migrant workers into urban life. And also there is a growing distance, like both psychologically and also culturally from their, from their rural region. So to understand the linkages between rural urban migration and also urban food security, uh, the Hungry Cities Partnership conducted a series of surveys uh, in the city um, between 2015 and 2019. So this includes a how urban household food security survey in 2015, as you can see in the, on the map, that these are the distribution of the sample size. Um, and also in a 2017 survey uh, with small scale food retailers, um, including market vendors and also small food shops, owners and street vendors. Um, there was another survey conducted in 2018 by our Nanjing University team on how farm household, on how migrants are engaging in, uh, in the agriculture in, the, in this region and also uh, a 2019 survey on supermarkets. And um, this is uh, the distribution of uh, the 42 wet markets or public food markets, uh, the major source of fresh produce uh, in Chinese cities uh, that we surveyed uh, in, in the 2017 survey. And this is a, a image that shows um, what a typical kind of wet market look like in, in a city. So um, we, we designed the 2015 survey to understand the general kind of household food security status, uh, not really uh, you know, thinking about migration at that time. So um, we have to rely on the indicator of the birthplace of household head to understand briefly how you know, migrants are experiencing food access and food security in, in, this, in, in Nanjing. So when we compare 
migrant house with compare households with a, a household head born um you know in another rural area in China with you know households with household head born in a city in an urban area we see that households with rural born household heads are more likely to be food insecure than other groups as you can see in the upper table um that their household food insecurity access score scale score is uh is above one and while the all the two other groups are below one the higher score of, of HFIAS indicates a higher level of food insecurity but I should acknowledge that HFAIAS uh, ranges from 0 to 27. So you can see that this is still a very low number, which indicates that in overall, they are enjoying a relatively high level of food security compared to you know, perhaps other cities in, in, other, in other, other countries in the global south or even in the global north. And the lower level also shows that uh, households with rural born household heads are less likely to have a high level of household dietary diversity score. So um, migrants, uh, we found that they have been engaging in the urban food system in various ways. And because of the, the very interesting characteristics of the food provisioning system uh, in Chinese cities, um, so the food, a lot of, according to our survey, most of the urban residents access uh, food, especially fresh produce, uh, vegetables and meat, uh, mainly from uh, wet markets. Uh, these are public markets uh, supported by the government, uh, usually receiving various kinds of subsidies. Um, and uh, in these kinds of markets, there are usually you know, 20 to 40 different vendors, small vendors competing with each other. Um, and also, all of them, um, almost all of them, are sourcing food uh, from wholesale centers. These are whole, large wholesale markets that host hundreds or even thousands of small food vendors uh, that transport uh, food from all over the country or even from abroad. So um, this kind of very um, this kind of landscape of food provisioning dominated by small vendors, you know, provides a lot of opportunities for migrants uh, to find jobs uh, in, in the food sector, in the food retailing sector. So you can see some of the photos that the of, of small food shops in the middle. Um, and also on the right hand side, you can see uh, like a uh, a, a small breakfast, um, breakfast uh, store opened uh, by migrants. So they have um, worked in wholesale markets and also wet markets, small food shops and street vending. And uh, there are some numbers. We found that majority of vendors working in these different kinds of food outlets are actually migrants. They are, uh, the, the birthplace of the household head actually came from a rural area in China. Um, and this, a small proportion of them actually uh, you know, it actually are from uh, the rural area or this uh, within the Nanjing kind of municipality boundary, but they migrated to the city and find uh, jobs in the food retailing sector. And um, there's a growing number of new generation of migrants, uh, I just mentioned, uh, start to find uh, jobs in the food delivery sector. Uh, according to the national statistics, um, by the end of 2021, um, there were 13 million of, of young you know, people from the countryside working as uh, food delivery drivers uh, in cities. And 77% um, of this total number, um, according to this uh, study in 2018, were actually rural urban migrants. And they work very hard and uh, they uh, are very familiar with all the streets and they are easily, they can easily navigate around the city. And uh, so they have been deeply embedded. Uh, their daily life has been deeply embedded in, into the urban, um, urban system. And um, we should also say that although we emphasize a lot that we shouldn't have a, a rural bias when we examine you know, food policies, uh, a lot of our speakers talk about this, but we found that migrants also play a very important role in local food production. So these are migrant farmers and they have been uh, you know, uh, involving extensively in uh, local uh, fresh uh, food production, especially uh, through greenhouse cultivation. And you can see uh, the map here, 
uh, in the 25 years uh, between 1995 and 2019, there's a, alongside the rapid growth of the urban area, as indicated in the red color or red dots on the map, there are also a, a significant increase of greenhouses, uh, you know, a, across the city, you can see as represented shown in the in the green dots. And they are younger generations and they, they, they operate larger farmlands compared to local smallholders. And they also pay rent to rent land from local farmers and provide employment opportunities to local elderly people. So they not just directly contribute to urban food security by supplying the local market with fresh produce and fruits, but also they contribute to the, the regional food security by providing income for the, for the left behind you know, population uh, of mainly the elderly in the, in the countryside, in the peri-urban area. Um, so um, they do face various kinds of challenges that we found that some migrant vendors, they earn, um, uh, in general, they earn less than local vendors. And you can see that the average monthly profit per stall in, in these different kinds of markets, uh, according to our survey, is almost 40% lower than you know, households uh, that mi migrants were actually born in the city. And there's also a notable higher percentage of non-local vendors, uh, including those born in rural areas uh, or another city, encountered verbal insults or prejudice. So to summarize, I, uh, there are four major key takeaways. And um, first is that the rise of migrant workers should be examined and, uh, against the backdrop of the changing urban rural dual system. Um, this is because the system really dictates how migrants are engaging with urban uh, food system and also uh, experiencing urban life. Um, and as Margaret says, <laughs> said, it's it really, uh, you know, um, dictates how who gets access to what. Uh, it's a it's a very uh, uh, important institutional setting that still exists today, despite all these uh, recent changes. The second key takeaway is that households migrated from rural areas are more likely to be food insecure, although that is they still enjoying a very high level of food security uh, compared to many other uh, regions in the world. And migrants play diverse and critical roles in urban food provisioning um, by working as migrant farmers, vendors in wholesale, wet markets, and other retail outlets and food uh, delivery men. And despite the various challenges facing uh, migrants, um, uh, we argue that rural urban migration is a solution rather than a problem to urban food security in the context of uh, urban China. Um, here are some references, and most of them are work uh, uh, posted on the hungrycities.net website. If you go to our website, hungrycities.net, you see uh, these reports and papers. And uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to share you with you a, a photo of migration <laughs> first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Zhenzhong, for that fascinating presentation. Uh, we move on to our next speaker. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Opio Onyango. Elizabeth is assistant professor at the University of Alberta in Canada. She completed her PhD in health geography at the University of Waterloo. Her recent research focuses on the role of formal and informal social protection systems in boosting food security of urban households and effects of COVID-19 on household food security. Um, her presentation focuses on rural urban migration and dietary deprivation in urban Kenya. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thanks so much, uh, Sujeta, for the introduction. And uh, I also appreciate uh, the organizers of this uh, particular conference today and uh, the opportunity to really uh, share part of uh, my work. And uh, my presentation today is uh, based on uh, some of the analysis that uh, uh, I did as uh, a postdoc with uh, my food uh, project as well as uh, the Hungry Cities uh, Partnership. So I'll be talking about uh, rural urban migration and uh, dietary deprivation in Nairobi, Kenya. And this work uh, was done in collaboration uh, with uh, our partner, 
in Nairobi. Uh, that's uh, the team led by Dr. Sam or Warren uh, uh, in lesson with uh, Jonathan Crush. So I believe that uh, uh, the earlier presentations really give uh, uh, a lot of uh, information and uh, some of these might uh, seem to be repetitive, but uh, uh, I hope uh, there'll be something for us to really learn from um, uh, my presentation as well. So in terms of my presentation outline, I'll begin by giving some uh, uh, background information, some facts about uh, migration, uh, urbanization in um, the global south, in Nairobi or in Kenya uh, in general. I'll then talk about um, the research methodology that was adopted uh, for this particular work. And uh, I'll present some uh, research findings and uh, give some concluding remarks based on um, other findings uh, from this analysis. So uh, just to look at uh, uh, the wider picture, uh, generally cities uh, in the global south are rapidly urbanizing and uh, the UN estimates that uh, by 2050, nearly 62% of uh, uh, the population in this, um, uh, especially in the global south, would be found uh, within uh, the urban areas. Of interest to me or uh, to us in this particular presentation, uh, the cities within uh, East Africa, particularly in Kenya, uh, as well as uh, in Tanzania, uh, which uh, uh, really shows that uh, a lot of uh, cities in these uh, uh, countries are going to be growing in terms of their population size. And uh, this is demonstrated by this particular uh, map, which shows that uh, in the next uh, a few years, uh, we expect to see uh, cities uh, grow uh, in this part um, with over 10 million uh, population uh, size, or even now, uh, uh, some going up to uh, between five to 10 million people. And Nairobi is one of these particular cities. So the city uh, of Nairobi is basically considered to be an economic hub for most of um, the East African uh, uh, cities or most uh, the part of uh, East Africa. So, and it's seen as one of uh, the fastest growing cities uh, in the world. Although Kenya is uh, predominantly rural, uh, the country seems to be rapidly urbanizing. And it's not only in Nairobi uh, because uh, even uh, smaller cities or what have been termed as uh, secondary cities are also um, really growing as, as fast as uh, we can imagine. And um, according to the World Bank, uh, just uh, in 2021, 20, 28% 20, of Kenya's population uh, now live within urban areas. And based on um, the World Bank's uh, prediction of uh, 2011, uh, this particular trend is bound to uh, really continue and by 2050, it is uh, projected that um, over 60% of Kenya's population would be living uh, within the uh, urban areas. If we look at uh, Nairobi city, most of these uh, particular immigrants who tend to move from their rural communities into uh, the city, majority of them found themselves uh, living in precarious conditions and uh, they tend to settle in um, the informal settlements within the city. And this particular image just uh, shows us uh, some of the uh, areas within the city uh, that are considered to be uh, informal. And uh, as this is happening within the city, there are studies that have also shown that uh, Nairobi is growing through, uh, through a major nutritional uh, changes, there are so many other things that are happening in terms of um, the kind of foods that people have access to. And this is reflected in terms of uh, uh, the health outcomes that are seen amongst uh, uh, these, um, uh, the city dwellers, uh, especially within the informal areas. Other studies uh, that focus on uh, nutritional changes and uh, household dietary diversity have tended to uh, be within the informal settlement uh, areas uh, in this particular city. And uh, such studies have uh, demonstrated that um, individual traits, uh, including uh, also household characteristics, as well as uh, the prevailing uh, systemic factors within uh, the food environment, uh, in the city tend to determine the kind of foods that people have access to. But uh, what is not yet clearly understood within uh, Nairobi 
is um, the connections that really exist between uh, migration and dietary diversity under conditions of uh, rapid urbanization. So this particular work uh, came in to uh, really address this, uh, uh, this gap. And we conducted uh, an analysis of uh, dietary quality and uh, diversity in uh, urban households, particularly those with uh, uh, some rural connection. So we used uh, a citywide um, household uh, food security survey, which was done uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, the partners uh, at uh, the University of Nairobi. And this was a, a survey that was done in uh, uh, 2017. So it's a little old, but I still believe that uh, there's much for us to learn from this. So this analysis aimed to determine the interactions between food security and rural urban uh, food transfers. We also endeavored to identify predictors of dietary diversity in uh, rural urban migrant households. So the work was uh, based on uh, a quantitative uh, uh, survey questionnaire, which uh, measured uh, uh, food insecurity based on um, uh, household food insecurity access score, as well as uh, household dietary diversity score. The sampling for this uh, uh, study uh, was based on uh, uh, different types of uh, sampling methodologies. So that is a uh, multi-stage uh, sampling. Uh, we also did uh, proportionate sampling and then uh, uh, the specific households or even other specific participants who are identified using stratified random sampling. In total, uh, we had uh, a sample size of uh, 1,414 uh, uh, respondents. But uh, given the focus of this particular analysis, uh, which uh, is on uh, uh, people with uh, some rural connection, uh, the analysis is based on uh, 874 respondents. Uh, for this, we did a descriptive analysis as well as uh, some uh, analytical tests using uh, uh, logistic regression uh, in SPSs. And uh, I'll just talk briefly about uh, the results uh, that came out of this analysis. So when we did a descriptive analysis, uh, the findings uh, showed that uh, most of uh, these uh, rural households uh, within the cities uh, tend to be headed by uh, the male. And 87% of uh, the household heads are within the working age that is uh, between the ages of uh, 24 to 54 years, with 42% uh, of them uh, having some form of uh, employment, be it uh, self-employment or uh, some uh, part-time uh, kind of uh, employment. 81% 80, of uh, these individuals uh, tend to be educated. They have either secondary or tertiary education uh, level, and about 52% receive uh, some food uh, transfers from their rural connections. Household income vary considerably with uh, over half of uh, these particular households earning only uh, less than uh, $200 a month. And 62 or even 64% uh, of this uh, particular income is spent on uh, uh, food. Uh, and this is uh, within uh, a third of um, other, no, 62% uh, or uh, over a third of this uh, particular income is uh, uh, really uh, spent on, um, on food. I think these are uh, amazing. I think it should be two thirds is spent on food uh, for these uh, particular uh, individuals or for these particular households. And uh, because of these particular limitations in terms of uh, food access, most of these households rely on some specific coping mechanisms. Uh, for example, uh, they tend to borrow uh, either food uh, from uh, their neighbors or uh, people that are, are within their social network. There's a lot of meal sharing as well as uh, receiving food uh, transfers from the rural areas. And some small scale urban agriculture is also practiced by um, people within uh, uh, Nairobi city. So just um, uh, going uh, a little further to uh, understand or even uh, see some of uh, the foods that are transferred from uh, the rural areas. Uh, the analysis uh, showed, shows that uh, most commonly transferred foods are the staples uh, that uh, people tend to uh, consume a lot in Kenya. And that uh, are the grains, the potatoes, the beans, as well as uh, the fruits and uh, uh, vegetables uh, that uh, tend to leave the rural areas to the urban areas. And these particular foods are transferred um, not as regularly 
uh, most of the times uh, it seems like uh, within a year, uh, the households within the city tend to receive uh, these transfers either three to six times a year. And I'm imagining that uh, this is based on uh, uh, the harvesting periods within uh, the rural areas, because some of these uh, particular households, uh, or even most of these particular households keep their connections within the rural areas. And uh, uh, to an extent, some of them engage in uh, farming either through sending remittances or even uh, uh, maintaining some uh, parcels of land such that uh, when there is uh, a period of harvest, I tend to think that uh, these uh, foods are also uh, shipped back to um, the urban areas uh, to support households uh, with their food uh, needs. So just uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, food insecurity status of these particular households, based on uh, uh, household food insecurity access uh, prevalence, uh, at least three in four uh, rural migrant households experience some level of food insecurity. And looking at food security based on uh, uh, household dietary diversity score, it shows that 11% uh, of uh, rural migrant households ate only or even uh, got food uh, from uh, only one to two uh, food groups and uh, less than 4% are reported to have uh, the highest uh, food um, dietary diversity uh, according to this particular survey. So then just looking at this uh, using uh, uh, a cross tabulation, so uh, trying to uh, compare household uh, food insecurity uh, access uh, prevalence and uh, the foods that are transferred, uh, we see that uh, uh, foods like uh, are the grains that are uh, shipped or even are transferred to uh, the urban areas, households that are receiving these uh, uh, kind of foods uh, or even are these uh, a significant uh, kind of uh, uh, difference within and between uh, groups here, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, transfers of uh, uh, grains, transfer of beans and uh, transfer of vegetables. But I think with this particular analysis, we cannot uh, really say that uh, if we transfer these particular foods, then we are contributing to household food security. But I thought we just need to take note of this um, as uh, it, it can be uh, an area even uh, for future kind of uh, studies that uh, we can be able to uh, really explore and see whether specific transfers uh, really contribute uh, significantly to food, um, uh, to food security. But then when I, did this uh, in relation to household dietary uh, score or household dietary diversity score. Uh, it didn't show as much uh, uh, significance in terms of um, these transfers contributing to dietary uh, diversity in the household. So just uh, uh, continuing further with uh, the cross tabulation, uh, these findings are, are really uh, shows that uh, there are certain factors within the households that are significantly uh, influence um, uh, food security status. So far more significant uh, is the education level and uh, employment status of uh, the household head. So with uh, increment in terms of uh, educational attainment, uh, there's also an increase in terms of dietary uh, diversity in the household. And uh, uh, a similar trend is also witnessed with uh, employment status uh, in this particular household. So then um, uh, a further analysis using uh, ordinal uh, logistic regression uh, basically shows that uh, some of these particular factors are quite important in terms of um, uh, showing uh, changes uh, in dietary diversity uh, scores in the households. So for example, education is associated with increased odds of higher dietary diversity and uh, receiving vegetable uh, transfers also um, showed uh, some um, significant results, which I found uh, to be quite uh, uh, fascinating, uh, given the fact that uh, within the urban areas, access to uh, fresh vegetables, uh, fruits, uh, is quite um, uh, limited to an extent. But I know within Nairobi city, access to uh, protein source, uh, protein foods like meat uh, or even um, fish becomes a, a huge problem. But then uh, just looking at vegetable transfer, those households that are, are tended to receive these particular transfers uh, have been, uh, or even attended to report that uh, they had a higher dietary diversity. There might be other factors uh, that are um, 
also contributing to this, but I found this quite um, uh, interesting. So just uh, to conclude, uh, I would say that uh, within the Kenyan context, uh, or within the Nairobi uh, context, most of these particular foods that are transferred uh, are the staples uh, that uh, Kenyans tend to rely on. And although urban, uh, rural, or even a rural urban food transfers may not influence household dietary diversity, I think that uh, it could contribute to uh, perceived urban household uh, food security, uh, like uh, uh, based on what people uh, see as food. If you have your staples, you have uh, your grains, you have your beans, and that uh, these are, are received from the rural areas, then in that case, um, maybe that might be contributing to uh, people reporting that uh, they feel that uh, they are uh, food uh, are secure. And uh, transfers of these uh, uh, specific foods, especially the vegetables, may increase uh, household uh, dietary diversity uh, score. And households that are likely to experience uh, dietary deprivation are those households that uh, are within the margins, uh, particularly those that are living in precarious conditions within the informal uh, settlements within the, um, uh, within the slums uh, in the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, moving on to the final speaker of this session uh, is Andrew Zimmer. Andrew is a PhD student in the School of Geography and Development at the University of Arizona with interests in climate change and agriculture. His current work is part of a National Science Foundation funded research project on Kenya and Zambia, which seeks to understand the relationships between climate change, farmer decision making, food security, and livelihoods. Andrew's presentation engages with the socioeconomic determinants of maize price volatility in Southern Africa. Over to you, Andrew. Great, thank you. And thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's really exciting to uh, see some of the faces behind the names of, of the work I've been reading uh, throughout my PhD. Uh, I'm actually defending my dissertation here in three weeks. So this is one of my chapters uh, of my uh, final dissertation. Uh, so I'm excited to share it with you today. And um, have some discussion, uh, maybe some feedback from, from you guys. I mean, the final process is of uh, preparing it for submission. Um, so any feedback uh, is really grateful. But as mentioned, um, we're focused on uh, the determinants of maize price volatility in Southern Africa, maize price being something that can fluctuate up and down. Uh, and, and in this paper, we present more of a, a food systems or a socio-environmental approach uh, to understanding what drives this volatility um, is it related to climate conditions within the growing season, um, or is it something that varies across markets just by the sort of market characteristics uh, that exist? So this is a very collaborative project uh, across the University of Arizona and, and the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, it's been going on for a, a few years now, and um, we're excited to share some of the results that are coming out. Um, but before we dig into... Um, my analysis and what we'll be discussing today, I wanted to sort of zoom out and give a big picture uh, sort of overview, which uh, Elizabeth touched on a little bit as well. Um, and I'm sure all, all of those uh, that are here today interested in rural to urban migration and population change uh, are pretty acutely aware of. Um, we know that the global population is rising. Uh, lots of this uh, increase in population is, is focused in the developing world. Um, we can see on the left hand uh, side here, uh, there have been rapid uh, population increases in Asia, uh, and then projections indicate that Africa will be sort of the center of the uh, next huge population increase. Uh, we don't just have population increase uh, in absolute numbers. Uh, we also have a population increase in urban areas, this intensification of uh, people living in urban areas, uh, which uh, brings in some sort of nuanced changes to food systems where uh, food produced in rural areas now needs to flow into a food system to be uh, processed and transported and, and provided for urban consumers uh, that aren't necessarily connected to uh, rural agricultural production. And future projections going forward to 2050 indicate uh, massive increases uh, in urban population. And so we've got this uh, kind of change in the uh, demand side of a food system where people are concentrated in urban areas and, and primarily buying food. 
Uh, and at the same time, we have uh, climate variability, uh, which has always kind of been present uh, and challenging for agriculture, but we also have the impacts of climate change that will become more acute uh, in the future. And so these impacts of climate variability and change are impacting agricultural production. And this is especially acute in Southern Africa, which limits food system supply. So it's, it's challenging to produce food uh, in a variable climate, uh, where the connections between uh, climate, rainfall, temperature, uh, and growing season productivity uh, are kind of tightly linked. So many, there are many studies out there using crop models uh, to look at what future uh, maize or different crop production might look like in the future, uh, attributing it to whether it might be climate change or climate variability, uh, and finding that climate variability is, is responsible for lots of yield variation. So whether we produce more food in one year and less food in another, uh, and then future projections, uh, looking at climate change and a, a sort of forward-looking scenario, um, project massive yield decreases, uh, particularly in Southern Africa and particularly for maize crops. So you can see um, the chart at the bottom right there. Uh, you can see maize kind of stands out. Uh, it's red because it's really important. Uh, and then it's, uh, you know, massive yield declines uh, in the future. And this is only by 2030. So pretty uh, close horizons and, and will be amplified uh, if we go up to 2100 or, or further from there. Uh, and so we have these kind of uh, coupled impacts of uh, rising urban populations uh, and climate change and variability, uh, and they create really tight couplings between this rural agricultural production uh, and urban food security. Uh, food prices are a mechanism that allow for these changes in production and consumption and how they kind of fluctuate up and down, uh, and it can act as a, a kind of a proxy for food security. So here's a kind of overview of uh, how I conceptualize food systems from the high level panel of experts. Uh, and I, I see food system drivers as kind of uh, pretty much based in climate, uh, allowing for food production and population as, as kind of food demand. Uh, lots of other aspects of a food system from supply availability and, and consumer behavior. Um, but this climate and population kind of drivers uh, sets a uh, uh, food system price um, which ultimately uh, impacts people's ability to afford or access food uh, in different urban settlements, which directly impacts uh, their food security. Um, we know in Southern Africa uh, and across the Sub-Saharan African region, uh, maize is an incredibly important crop for livelihoods, both in rural areas, um, but for food consumption uh, in urban areas. Uh, but despite this, yields may remain low compared to other regions of the world. Uh, and part of this because um, production is focused on these sort of smallholder uh, rainfall-based agricultural settings, uh, it's really vulnerable um, to climate variability and, and the impact of climate change, uh, where production is, is tightly coupled to uh, growing season uh, rainfall conditions. Um, maize represents more than 55% of the calories consumed uh, in both rural and urban areas in Southern Africa, so any changes in production or food price uh, directly impacts people's diets uh, and ultimately their food security. In Southern Africa, um, maize is typically, typically grown in a single rainfall season. Um, at the bottom here, you can see the pattern of precipitation uh, throughout the year. This is just for Lusaka in Zambia, uh, but it's pretty representative uh, of the uh, region as a whole. Where we have this kind of winter uh, from a Northern Hemisphere perspective uh, with rainfall um, starting in October uh, and running through to sort of March, April, May time. And the uh, growing season, uh, in terms of the agricultural smallholder setting, uh, responds in a similar manner, uh, where crops are usually planted uh, in this October-November time, grown through the rainfall season, uh, and then harvested uh, when the maize uh, might reach maturity, sort of in this March-April-May time period. Uh, and then we define, uh, for the purpose of this study, a post-harvest season uh, as that period after harvest where maize is available, uh, all the way through until when the next harvest uh, becomes available for people to purchase. Uh, and so this post-harvest season is really important because that's where most of the food is available. Uh, that's where food prices are kind of set based on the amount of supply we have in the system. Uh, and they are subject to change uh, depending on how productive that growing season was. Uh, and it can't be kind of modified until uh, the subsequent growing season is harvested uh, and maize is available again. Uh, and so we can kind of categorize uh, maize price uh, as broadly responding to these uh, kind of seasonal production patterns. Uh, this is kind of a, a hypothetical line we draw on here uh, of how maize price might respond to these uh, individual growing seasons. 
uh, where if we have precipitation that starts in October, November, December, runs through until March, April, May, when we have this harvest time. Uh, after harvest, maize is available, uh, and usually price will drop uh, broadly within the system. Uh, so price will drop to a minimum uh, and then steadily increase throughout this post-harvest season uh, until we have another harvest, at which point uh, maize price will typically drop again. But the degree to which uh, this line follows the same gradient uh, depends on a number of factors, and that's what we're really interested in, in studying in, in this paper, uh, is does the gradient of the line or the response for maize price variability uh, change uh, because of the individual market characteristics? So do really isolated markets respond uh, with this pattern as opposed to really well-connected markets? Uh, but also how do growing season climate conditions uh, impact uh, the gradient of the line too? So if it was a really productive agricultural year, uh, one might expect that to be ab abundant maize and uh, less of a kind of price spike in this post-harvest season as opposed to a very dry uh, year without much rainfall and high temperatures uh, where there might not be as much of a drop because there isn't as much maize available uh, and then really sharp price spikes uh, in this post-harvest season uh, which tightly connects to uh, urban food security where people are buying food and so uh, they're relatively uh, inelastic to the price that, that is set within markets and so they have to purchase food uh, at high prices uh, if it's available or go through other kind of dietary restrictions uh, to be able to sort of satisfy their food budget. Uh, and so our main research questions in trying to understand the patterns of, of these, these changes is basically what's going on. So what are the patterns of maize price volatility in Southern Africa, both through space, so across different market settings, uh, but also through time, does this vary uh, by season? Uh, and then what's causing it? So. Uh, if we know about these changes, can we figure out uh, what are some of the drivers or the determinants uh, of these uh, maize price patterns uh, based on climate, uh, so growing season climate conditions, uh, land use variability, uh, and then geographic distance, uh, is a market isolated or, or well connected? And so we can kind of uh, understand uh, future patterns uh, when we can isolate markets that might be uh, you know, less connected to infrastructure uh, or might be subjected to uh, future climate variability and change. And so to do this, we use the World Food Programme's uh, market level maize price data. It's a really incredible data set that uh, covers a range of different crops uh, and lots of different markets throughout Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and globally. Uh, and we kind of isolated uh, 2003 to 2020 as the most consistent time period. Uh, and we have 74 markets here split across uh, Malawi, Mozambique, and Zambia. Uh, here we're just looking at the average uh, price through time. Uh, it's monthly level price uh, in local currency. So we go through a, a big exercise of um, converting this to uh, US dollars per kilo. So it's kind of a common unit. Uh, and then correcting for inflation as well, obviously. Uh, 2008, we've got some uh, kind of interesting price dynamics happening there. Um, but going back to that con conceptual figure of maize price um, that I mentioned, uh, we can kind of have a look at that uh, on the chart here. So if we look at 2006, uh, we can see in that kind of harvest season, there's a really sharp decline in price. Uh, and then in the following year, uh, maize price doesn't go up uh, particularly much. And so one might imagine that is a particularly good growing season. Maize is abundant, so the price drops and it doesn't rise too much uh, in the following post-harvest season. If we contrast this uh, with 2008, for example, uh, we see less of a decline in this uh, harvest period, but then a really sharp rise uh, in this uh, post-harvest season, particularly for Mozambique and Malawi. Zambia has a little bit of a different pattern, uh, potentially due to the Food Reserve Agency where uh, they will purchase maize from farmers and be able to store it uh, to alleviate food insecurity in the event of uh, price spikes like this. And so we're able to use this uh, market level maize price data and derive various metrics that help us describe this kind of post harvest price change. Uh, alongside that, we uh, get a bunch of climate, land use, geography and population uh, variables uh, for each of these markets that we have. Uh, we define growing season climate anomalies, so whether uh, the specific growing season uh, in a specific year was above average uh, in terms of precipitation, temperature or below average. Uh, we calculate the distance between each market uh, and capital cities and also networks of urban neighbors, uh, understanding that if uh, cities like in the Copper Belt area of Zambia, if they're really tightly connected, uh, that might uh, promote some unique uh, price dynamics where they're able to sort of bring maize in from uh, around the country, uh, and the price might change as a result. Uh, 
We also look at proximal land use, so the percentage of the district or the regional area that's engaged in agriculture uh, with a view to understand uh, how uh, urban areas might be connected to rural production directly, uh, rather than being in this sort of uh, domestic food system. And then we focus on urbanization dynamics, uh, knowing that places are growing pretty rapidly, uh, and we have some variety uh, in urban places in our sample. So we uh, have urban population in 2015, so just the number of people that live in each market area, uh, but also the population growth through time. So how quickly are these uh, places growing? So uh, potentially in a situation that has a, a low population, but really rapidly growing, there could be some unique price dynamics uh, where there is a, a, a huge source of demand uh, but not so much supply because the place uh, is growing pretty quickly. Uh, and so we generate three variables based on the price data to be able to describe these post harvest changes, these kind of uh, dynamics of this uh, gradient after the harvest time. Uh, we look at post harvest average, which is just the average price throughout this whole post harvest period. Is it high? Is it low? It's, it's pretty static. Um, we have a look at coefficient of variation, so month to month, how much does price change in these markets? Is it really variable uh, or is it pretty consistent in this post-harvest season? Uh, and then we derive post-harvest price change, this PHPC variable, um, which is the difference between the lowest point immediately after the harvest, so when maize is released to the market, and then the highest point uh, before the next harvest. So we can kind of look at the gradient of the line uh, using this variable. And you can see here how they vary through space and time. Uh, across country and then through the years starting at 2002 and all the way through to 2017 at the top uh, and so pretty variable in terms of average price we noticed some uh, reasonably large fluctuations in the average maize price at different market settings uh, variability is reasonably high too so zero to 50 percent uh, variability uh, in that post harvest period uh, and then post harvest price change in terms of the uh, linear trend between low and high, it's generally positive. So we're generally noticing uh, that price is increasing in this post harvest period. We do have some observ observations where price continues to decline in this post harvest season, but generally uh, price rises in, in the kind of lean season as you might expect. And so to perform an analysis, we did a kind of two step fixed effect linear regression model controlling for a bunch of things. I won't bore you with uh, the models uh, and numbers too much, um, but we regress uh, maize price volatility is these, the average, the coefficient variation and the price change. Uh, first against climate anomalies, so we can control for market level variables uh, and in any interpolated data uh, for the uh, maize price uh, by months. Uh, there was some missing data, so we interpolate that. And so that's our first model. Uh, and then from that, we run a second model um, with maize price volatility, the same metrics as our outcome variables, um, but this time we regress against market characteristics, uh, which are time invariant, so they're kind of static population distance. Uh, they're not changing uh, in our model, at least through time. Uh, and so we can have a look at some of these patterns uh, alongside the climate uh, impact. And, and so broadly, we'll just go through a few of the results. Uh, we find that maize price is highly variable through space and time. We kind of saw that on the previous chart. Uh, and so that almost answers our what's going on. Uh, we know it's really variable. Uh, we find that on average, maize prices are uh, around a quarter of a dollar in the post-harvest season. Uh, and the price changes uh, range between uh, negative, so declining in this post-harvest season, to being pretty rapid uh, increases. So uh, going up by around half a dollar per kilo in the post-harvest season. When we extrapolate this out to uh, local currency and comparing to local incomes, these changes are uh, pretty acute in terms of uh, household income and, and food expenditure, uh, and so can have kind of a direct impact uh, on households' food security. Uh, but then we really want to dig into what's causing it. So we know these patterns uh, are happening. We know maize price is volatile and it's changing through time and over space, um, but what is it that's driving this? Uh, and we find that climate is a factor, uh, but the market characteristics will really amplify these challenges, which is important uh, looking forward to uh, future climate impacts. Uh, so we find that climate plays a role, uh, and when growing season temperatures uh, were higher than average, so it's a particularly warm growing season, uh, we have uh, across markets uh, higher average prices and larger price changes. So the price is already higher, um, but the change in this post harvest season uh, is even stronger as a result. Interestingly, we find that higher average precipitation uh, results in higher average, average prices um, was kind of surprising to us that, uh, you know, productive growing seasons in terms of precipitation uh, had higher, higher average prices. And so we're still kind of trying to tease out the mechanism behind this one. 
Um, but then the market characteristics really stand out as uh, sort of being these static time invariant uh, things that can impact uh, food price volatility. Uh, when markets located close to the capital city uh, generally have lower post harvest price changes. And so uh, if you're close to this big city with, where it can draw food in from around the country, uh, generally uh, the price changes you'll experience are less. So isolated markets might be more vulnerable. We also find that markets close to neighbors have uh, in general lower average prices, uh, but larger variability. So in the Copper Belt of Zambia, for example, where we saw this cluster of markets, uh, in general, uh, Prices are lower on average, but larger variability going up and down, uh, potentially related to the source of demand that is there. Uh, and so they can bring in food, but it's spread across uh, different urban areas. So uh, maybe causing variability in, in uh, post harvest prices. We find that markets located to agricultural land have less price variability, as one might expect. Uh, if you're located close to rural production, uh, you have this kind of tight linkage where you can access food without it uh, having to flow into your town. Uh, and so there's less variable prices as you're connected to these uh, agricultural settings. And then finally, markets with larger populations uh, typically have lower uh, prices. So if you're in a big city, usually prices will be lower uh, than if you're in a smaller urban place. And so zooming back out to a big picture as way of summary, uh, we know that population is continuing to rise and is increasingly urban, especially in Southern Africa. Uh, we find that climate conditions uh, in the growing season directly impact maize production uh, and price responds to this uh, production and population shocks together, uh, which can directly impact uh, household food security and especially uh, poor urban households. Uh, we show that maize price is really variable uh, in urban areas through space and time. Uh, it's driven by complex food system interactions, so it's not just the impact of uh, climate variability on growing seasons, which has previously been shown in the literature, uh, but it's a connection of uh, climate and also these uh, time invariant market characteristics or population dynamics uh, that come together uh, to impact uh, price volatility. So uh, overall, this analysis helps us identify uh, urban markets that might be vulnerable to climate shocks, uh, whether they're isolated uh, or not. Uh, but if we have a climate shock in the system, it might be amplified in these settings that are already kind of disadvantaged in terms of experiencing higher price uh, shocks or higher average prices. Uh, and so as rural uh, to urban migration continues uh, and the impacts of climate change intensify, uh, understanding when and where these shocks will impact food security is really vital for uh, allocating aid or uh, in Zambia, the case of the Food Reserve Agency, uh, having silos where they can uh, allow for uh, food to flow into uh, marginal uh, urban settlements to alleviate some of these price shocks uh, and hopefully uh, satisfy food demand. And so I'll leave it there. Uh, happy to discuss and answer any questions that people have. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and I really enjoyed hearing uh, everybody else's presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, food production is a key component of food security and climate change has an important bearing on uh, the long-term impact on food security as well. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A, which I'll ask presently. Uh, to all attendees, please add your questions to the Q&A if you haven't already, so I can ask the presenters on your behalf. Um, and before I ask the questions that have already been posed, let me begin by asking Andrew a couple of questions. Um, Andrew, maize, as you said, is a staple food in many parts of Southern Africa. I wanted to find out the reason why certain countries were chosen as opposed to others and why Zimbabwe and South Africa were omitted because one is a surplus country and other is a deficit country? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm glad you asked because that, um, so when we started out the phone in the analysis, uh, obviously we're using this World Food Program data. Uh, and so we tried to take everything for the whole Southern African region, including uh, South Africa, including Zimbabwe. Uh, and we just found that the uh, spatial distribution of markets wasn't great. There was one or two markets in Zimbabwe. Um, but then also the temporal record uh, was pretty spotty, so lots of years of missing data. And so ideally we would have the whole region, um, but we kind of prioritized having a really long record to compare uh, multiple, multiple um, growing seasons so we can really understand the impact of uh, climate variability. Uh, and unfortunately we had to drop those uh, countries out. But if there is data on prices throughout uh, those areas, we can certainly like run it again and, and add those to the mix. Um, 
And so we, we kind of feel that as though the three countries are fairly representative, um, but also recognize that uh, there is nuance in South Africa and Zimbabwe, as you mentioned, with uh, surplus food production and food demand from other countries uh, that have some more uh, nuanced dynamics as well. But really good point. Thanks. Uh, so two, two more questions. The second question is in terms of climate change. Uh, were extreme weather events such as hurricanes and cyclones also taken into account? Not in our analysis. We, uh, over kind of this 17 year period that we analyzed, we just uh, primarily look at climate variability. So we compare precipitation and temperature. Um, we've done various different formulations of precipitation and temperature, uh, different patterns within the growing season of whether it's a dry period or a really intense temperature spike. But we primarily look at those two. Uh, and then just over this 17 year period compared to the long term record. So uh, we calculate the average growing season conditions from 1981 to present day and then compare each year to that. So whether it was a good year or whether it was a bad year. But we don't have uh, any information about uh, like extreme winds or hurricanes or storms or anything like that. We just primarily look at temperature and precipitation, which uh, in the literature is commonly compared to kind of agricultural growing season conditions. Um, but I'm sure we could benefit from adding other things in it, it would make it a kind of stronger uh, model in the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And finally, I think if Zimbabwe were added, uh, would events such as the land distribution, the economic crisis, those elements would then factor into your analysis and would appear uh, in terms of the findings as well. Is, is, that, uh, is that true? Yeah, certainly, yeah. With, with Zimbabwe, obviously, uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, really uh, intense uh, price spikes, which we, we try to alleviate across the countries by um, bringing it into a common currency and correcting for inflation, uh, which would control for a little bit of that. But uh, in Zimbabwe, and during that period, uh, it'd be particularly difficult to kind of get it to the same comparable price, um, which no doubt would impact some of the findings as well. Uh, across the three countries, there are different kind of market structures and agricultural systems. Um, it's primarily smallholder ag producing maize for domestic consumption, um, but the degree to which this is spread out or is really condensed in, in corners of the country uh, is variable. We, we get at that a little bit by looking at um, the distance to proximal agriculture, so th those kind of rural urban connections, um, but could add if we had uh, an understanding of where food is produced primarily for different urban settlements. Uh, we could add that to a model as well and be able to sort of understand those uh, linkages with a bit more nuance. But yeah, really good uh, stuff. Thank you very, thank you very much, Andrew. That was yeah. great. Um, so there are two questions uh, from Joe for uh, Zhenzhong and Tayang. Uh, the first question is, um, what do you mean by food insecure in your second takeaway point? Are they hungry or do they have nothing to eat? Uh, the second question uh, for, again, for Zhenzhong and Tayang is, what kinds of younger people are migrant farmers in Nanjing? I thought that most young migrant people would choose to be in service sectors such as delivery guys or restaurant waiters or in the construction business. Um, thank you. Thank you, Joel, for that question. These are really great questions. Um, first, I want to apologize for the mi misleading message about the establishment of the Hukou system. Uh, when I say 1949, I was just referring to the funding of the PRC. Um, so the Hukou system was established after at that time, but apparently, yes, it is much later. Um, and thanks for the clarification. So regarding the first question, um, I think it's, I did not have time to go into details about the matrix, um, the HFIAS we used, the House of Food Insecurity Access Scale. Um, so I just want to clarify that in when we use that indicator to evaluate House of Food Security, um, we asked respondents to answer a set of nine questions. Um, and these questions could be actually categorized into two major groups. And one is a group of questions about the, the, the amount of food, the insufficient amount of food. And such as, for example, um, the how, uh, in the past four weeks, did you worry that your household would not have enough food to eat or you have to go to sleep at night hungry or have to eat uh, skip meals or have to eat fewer meals? So there are few questions uh, 
about the insufficiency of, of food and which apparently are very uh, you know severe indicators of food insecurity but there are also a few other questions uh, about the quality of food or the the preference of food uh, for example were you or a household member not able to eat the kinds of food uh, you preferred or um, do you, you have to lim eat a limited variety of food due to the lack of resources? So when we say when we say that uh, the um, migrants in in Nanjing are, are generally food more food insecure compared to other groups of people, we meant that uh, they are mainly you know uh, they have to eat uh, certain kinds of food that they they they. You know they do not prefer or they have to eat a limited variety of food uh, due to the lack of financial resources so we find the majority of of those food insecure people fall into those category so the problem is that the hfis indicator um does not really distinguish these two groups of questions and they just give all these answers the same weight right so apparently people who um would have no access to food is facing a much more severe food insecurity situation compared to those households who just couldn't eat the kinds of food uh, they prefer. So I just want to emphasize that um, this is a, the, the one of the problems of, of HFIAS. And uh, we also use the other indicator uh, called HFIAP to recalculate uh, these answers and uh, regroup all these households into, uh, into um, um, four different uh, categories, including food secure, moderately food insecure, mo uh, sorry, mildly food insecure, moderately food insecure, and severely food insecure. So that indicator uh, is, is better because it treats the nine questions uh, differently. Um, regarding the second question, um, what I meant uh, when I said these are younger people, uh, what I mean that they, they are younger compared to the local farmers. Uh, not not mean it doesn't mean that they are in their twenties or thirties. Their average age uh, is we according to our survey is uh, forty eight point six years old. So it's still not that young, but compared to the local farmers, they're they are much younger. Um, and I guess this is probably because that uh, to migrate to a different region and rent a large plots of land and start your own agriculture business really demands some kind of resources and also uh, the entrepreneurial kind of spirit. So I think uh, that that's why younger people are more likely to, to become migrant farmers. Um, well, I also want to add that the, the average age of, of people working in wet markets, these vendors in wet markets, they are much younger. So uh, we found that 81% of all the surveyed wet market vendors are below the age of 35. Um, just want to add that. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Taiyang, if you want to add anything, please. No, thank you. Thanks. So Jonathan has a, a question for Andrew. Referencing the work of Agnes Jurfeld on maize remitting, to what extent does remitting outside market channels complicate the relationship between maize prices and food access and insecurity? Yeah, certainly. That, that's a really good point, right? We, we're using this uh, World Food Program data, which is uh, collected in markets uh, where you can quantify the price and, and record it. And so any food remittances or any food that flows, uh, albeit a little bit more informally, uh, is not recorded in our, uh, our data or our analysis. Uh, and so that is something uh, that we sort of miss and uh, is a key coping strategy for lots of households that can't necessarily afford to purchase food in markets, uh, to rely on uh, family members or other ties to rural areas to, to be able to access food in that way, um, which is really important. Um, we, we do a big scale analysis, so we're looking at the whole Southern African region, um, but if we were able to zoom into sort of a region of Zambia or a region of Malawi, uh, maybe we could sort of understand uh, the different prices that people are paying for food purchased in the market or food they're accessing um, from uh, rural areas directly uh, that would have a little bit more nuance. So certainly a, a, an important component uh, within urban uh, food security and urban livelihoods. Um, but isn't isn't incorporated in our sort of bigger scale um, uh, analysis. But really, really good point. Mm -hmm. 
So my, my next question is for Elizabeth. Um, I'm less familiar with rural urban migration, but in the context of international migration, it's sometimes assumed that migration is kind of a route out of poverty, you know, migrating out of poverty, is something you we've been hearing a lot. And it was very striking in your study that that was really not the case. And there was also for a certain portion of the cohort, there was no difference between people who had lived in urban areas for a long period of time and the, the newer arrivals. So I think I found that to be, um, a, that was a very striking finding. So that maybe you can talk a little bit about, more about that if you can. And the other question is whether the survey actually included questions on the quality of their life in rural areas of origin before they migrated. And what were there any differences that you could find in the in, in the analysis? Yeah, uh, thanks so much uh, uh, for that uh, uh, question. Um, I think I'll start with uh, the second uh, question and then I'll go to the first one. So uh, based on uh, uh, the Hungry Cities uh, Partnership uh, uh, Household Survey that was done uh, in 2017, uh, the survey did not really uh, include like a uh, uh, quality of health of uh, households within the rural areas, but uh, are the only questions that were captured uh, were in relation to uh, health outcomes uh, within the urban households. And uh, with this, uh, uh, the focus was mainly on uh, specific uh, health outcomes, not necessarily uh, extending it uh, beyond uh, well being, uh, like extending it to well being and uh, quality of life. So I think it's a limitation with this uh, particular study, and that's why I think uh, with the current uh, project, uh, My Food, we've uh, uh, had that uh, focus on our well-being, on health, and bringing in uh, extensive uh, kind of questions to cover um, uh, health and well-being within the urban household. I think one missing uh, factor, uh, which uh, is being addressed in um, other studies, um, like in uh, South Africa, but not in uh, in Kenya, is uh, in relation to also capturing information uh, about the rural households that are the households that are left in the rural areas. So it would be nice to really uh, extend uh, uh, these kind of studies to also see how those rural uh, connections, rural urban connections that exist, also contribute to health outcomes uh, within uh, the rural households and then also within the urban areas. So uh, just uh, uh, getting back to uh, the first uh, uh, question, uh, which was, uh, oh, sorry, what was it again? <laughs> just one key point. <laughs> well, that there was very little difference between the experiences of uh, new migrant arrivals and older migrants. Uh, but yes. So then uh, uh, in terms of... Uh, um, this particular analysis, oh yes, I remember that, the other bit of, uh, bit of it. So in terms of uh, uh, the uh, number of uh, years that people have stayed within uh, the city or even uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, migration as uh, a means of uh, improving quality of life, uh, running away from poverty uh, within the, the rural communities uh, into the cities, I think it's all dependent on uh, uh, employment opportunities. But uh, within uh, Nairobi or within uh, uh, the global south, I think a lot of people are moving from the rural areas into the urban uh, uh, centers. And uh, they end up uh, amongst that population that uh, uh, are not uh, really having uh, quality employment. They're not having um, uh, better employment opportunities. So a lot of them, uh, a lot of people tend to settle within uh, the informal uh, settlement. And, uh, some studies have shown that uh, uh, the conditions are even much worse within the informal settlements compared to what they left behind uh, in the rural communities. And this is uh, in relation to accessing basic amenities like water, uh, sanitation services, uh, food included, because if you can't really uh, have enough income uh, within an urban center where food is dependent on how much you can be able to spend, how much you can be able to uh, really buy, then that really increases your risk of being uh, food insecure. 
compared to those households in the urban areas where we still have uh, some arable land, we have parcels of land where people can plant and really have food uh, for their households. So it seems to me that uh, uh, as people migrate into uh, the rural, uh, into the urban areas from the rural communities, conditions are not really improving in terms of their quality of life. But uh, in uh, most cases, uh, it's worsening, and that's why uh, urban food insecurity has really become a hot topic, uh, and uh, it's an area that really needs to be addressed as we continue to see uh, that uh, most people are leaving the rural communities with the expectation that within the urban areas, they are going to have better quality of life. And I think that has a really significant impact on people's uh, well-being. From one of the uh, analyses that I did earlier on in a different paper, it really showed that uh, uh, that uh, disconnect between expectation, like when you move from the rural areas to the urban uh, settings and you have a high expectation in terms of uh, uh, the kind of employment you want to see, the kind of life you want to live. You've gone to school, you've gotten your uh, certifications, you've gotten your papers and all this, but you end up in this uh, area, in this city where there are no employment opportunities. So it just shows us the gaps that exist in terms of uh, employment creation and how that really relates back to uh, food security, status of the household, and then uh, the quality of life that people have. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. My final question is, is actually for Zhen Zhong and Taiyang. Zhen uh, Zhong, in your presentation, you said that some of the migrants, newer migrants, are working now as food delivery drivers. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very new kind of uh, economic sector because uh, there has been a rapid growth of uh, e-commerce uh, in China in the past decade, or maybe more than a decade um, so far. And uh, there, a lot of the drivers are working to deliver deliver um, goods from for those large uh, e-commerce platforms. Uh, most well known, like Taobao and uh, Jingdong, these are some of the uh, lar largest kind of e-commerce platforms. Um, so they create. Uh, you know, thousands and thousands of new jobs in, in the city. And food delivery is also something, you know, more recent that as some of these tech giants or e-commerce giants are entering the food sector. Previously, they were just selling kind of all kinds of small goods uh, online, but they are now selling also uh, food. And they are, uh, a lot of this food delivery are uh, delivering uh, ready-to-eat meals, actually, um, to people's doorsteps and or to offices in the city. A lot of people do not have even have their kitchen, or they don't cook, and they just order food on these platforms and get uh, those meals delivered every day. So um, I just want to say that this, uh, because of the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, there was a, a huge increase of uh, you know, um, e-grocery uh, businesses. And so a lot of this, uh, including startups and also those uh, big companies uh, spin-offs. And so they are selling uh, fresh produce online. So a lot of uh, this food delivery guy now are delivering fresh produce, uh, including fruits and vegetables and to, to people's uh, households, especially that uh, many of those households are experiencing lockdowns. And so the, they were not allowed to actually go and visit uh, those traditional public markets as usual. So these have been playing a very critical role in ensuring food supply in, in the city. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it, 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 what was interesting was that we had presentations from two of the largest countries, India and China, and there's some parallels that I was thinking of, especially in terms of in China, that that Huku migrant registration system, and in India, the introduction of Aadhaar, which is very similar to the social insurance system. It's a identification number, which actually confirms your right to access various uh, services, including in the case of India, uh, subsidized food rations. But uh, people who migrate are excluded because they are often told that they have to go back to the place they came 
came from and received those, those rations in those places. Can you tell us a little bit about how that registration system is organized? So how do they receive that identification? At what level does it materialize? And I'm wondering that if that also has an, a bearing on their ability to where they can migrate within China and then how they can participate in then the economies, including food economies of the areas that they migrate to. Just a, I mean, that's a, that's a very questions. good yeah. question, but it's a, it demands a very long answer. Yes. And I'm not an expert studying uh, the household registration system, to be honest. But my understanding and also my personal experience um, says that if you, uh, if you are born in a rural in a household with a rural registration, you, you are naturally granted a rural regis register. Um, but um, through various ways that people could change their registration. Uh, if you, for example, you could um, uh, pass the college entrance exam and go to a study in a university in some large cities, and uh, you could migrate your household registration to, to, to the city. And so you got an urban uh, registration. Uh, that's a, actually that's a common way for the younger generation of people who are born in the countryside to actually migrate their household registration to cities. And some, most of them, I wouldn't say most of them, maybe a lot of them are staying in the city after graduation so that after they find a job uh, and the company might offer them the, the, the chance to actually get a permanent uh, urban registration within that city. And the policy varies from city to city. Some of the cities like the major cities, Beijing or the capital city or Shanghai, it might be very challenging. Then the government set up a, a whole kind of set of criteria, right? So it, you have to meet all those criteria and get a certain level of marks in order to get uh, get the chance to 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 for the for the uh, the household registration uh, there. But um, smaller cities, they are, they are more flexible because they want to attract talents and younger people to, to, to find jobs and there and work there. So that's, I think it's, I also wanna say it is rapidly changing. Um, and because, because of the uh, kind of the aging of the population um, and the, the slowdown of the economy in recent years, I think the government uh, has been, some local governments have been competing you know, with each, with each other to attract talents. So they've been offering a lot of kind of um, uh, benefits uh, if you want to, you know, move there and find a work there and settle down. So I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's what I can say about the system. Yeah. Thank you very much, Zhenzhong, and thank you all to the to all of the presenters. These were excellent presentations, and to all of the attendees. Uh, this ends this session. Uh, I believe we have a closing summary. Uh, I'm going to hand over the mic to Dr. Rajan. No, I think uh, Jonathan can uh, take it up uh, with uh, Jonathan. Can you introduce? Uh, yeah, Jonathan. Yeah. Yes, I'll do that, uh, Rajan. Um, just waiting for um, Daniel to move. Yeah. Dan to be promoted to the panel. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Sujata. So um, I just want to uh, introduce uh, Professor Daniel Tabera, um, who uh, is an old colleague and friend. Uh, he's currently extraordinary professor at the University of the Western Cape. He's previously taught at uh, University of Eswatini and uh, Zimbabwe, uh, and is acknowledged expert on um, migration and development in uh, in uh, South Southern Africa and the continent uh, at large. Um, and uh, we've, uh, the other point I just want to emphasize is the team leader for the uh, My Food Network uh, in, uh, in South Africa. Um, and um, he's kindly agreed to just offer some uh, concluding uh, summary, his thoughts, uh, having um, listened to all of these different, uh, very diverse, uh, um, presentations. 
And uh, so um, over to you, uh, Dan, and uh, we look forward to hearing uh, your thoughts. Greetings, friends. Jonathan Crush asked me to give the closing remarks, and that's what I'm going to do. And today, uh, I need to follow my late grandfather's advice. His advice was, if you happen to give the last presentation of the day, keep it short and simple. And that's what I will try to do. Um, for two days, we have had insightful presentations and discussions that have given us a great opportunity to share the results of various ongoing uh, studies on uh, migration and food, essentially uh, my food. Uh, and these studies were carried out uh, in different parts of the world. And this was really uh, um, inspiring uh, because despite uh, the differences, you know, when we are talking about the global south, uh, there were a lot of com commonalities, common elements, as one sat and listened to the experiences of colleagues in uh, South America, in Asia and Africa. So I thought um, uh, that was something uh, quite interesting. But at the same time, there are also uh, uh, differences. And this is something I think we, uh, we should also focus on. Uh, what is the role of some of these? Uh, it could be cultural uh, or local factors, which uh, are explaining maybe the differences. So um, uh, that's that. I'm not going to attempt to summarize the vibrant presentations. Instead, I would like to appreciate the broad conceptual and empirical anchor uh, on which these studies have been uh, based. And there are several reasons uh, uh, for doing so. Uh, I thought the presentations did a very good job in attempting to unbundle uh, the existing silo. As you all know, uh, migration uh, studies have tended to, uh, to be located in these silos. Uh, you are focusing on migration. Uh, if you want to look at food, it's like you're e exiting that silo and then now uh, addressing food issues. But really what has been remarkable from uh, all the studies is how they've managed to uh, make the connections between uh, migration and food. And it was not just migration and food security, but it was also migration and food systems. And the moment you talk about food systems, uh, some of them are local or regional, national, and so on. So that provided, in my opinion, uh, another aspect focusing on uh, uh, migration issues, mostly in urban areas, but also having that uh, rural connection, uh, which you get when you uh, talk about uh, uh, food systems. The presentations directed our gaze to migration and food scholarship uh, in a rigorous um, way in terms of uh, conceptualization and the empirical approaches. Um, again, uh, I, this is something I thought uh, was quite refreshing. Um, and this is happening during early days. Uh, when one thinks about the My Food Project by the time uh, it comes to an end, 
these aspects will have been uh, consolidated. So they, they, the issues of uh, you know, conceptualization uh, operating, you know, after unbundling these silos, how really should we begin to think about um, uh, uh, food in the context of migration or food and precarity and so on? Um, so uh, conceptualization, I, I think that was uh, um, uh, that was uh, quite um, uh, useful in terms of the approach. Several papers have used precariat precarity approach to frame the studies, and this was also helpful in terms of um, uh, enabling us. Uh, well, if I can say, to fix set on the various intersectionalities beyond just uh, food and migration. Um, for example, uh, xenophobic violence is contributing to, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the you know, terrible situation of uh, uh, migrants. Uh, so um, I found that useful, uh, it was quite useful to make those, um, uh, those connections, especially uh, by focusing on factors such as inclusion. How do migrants get included and how are they excluded? And of course we know that is done in, in, in various ways, but all these factors uh, end up influencing uh, the food uh, security situation. Uh, in some cases, they do disrupt uh, the you know, fledgling uh, food systems where migrants uh, you know, are involved. Um, some of the speakers talked about uh, translocal livelihoods. Again, that provided um, uh, th that very important connection um, say within urban areas, um, you know, whereby you find uh, some migrants might be uh, working or might be plying their trade in the city center, but they are living in the peri urban zone, um, maybe a bit outside the city. I was thinking about um, uh, uh, what happened in Dinan now several years ago, whereby migrants were staying in the city but they were essentially uh, farm workers uh, because of uh, uh, different things. So um, through um, you know, those connections, we can look at uh, the disruptions, how these translocal livelihoods are being disrupted, say by uh, 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 xenophobic uh, violence. Um, so I, I thought that was um, um, quite useful. So in terms of uh, conceptual approaches, uh, that was that. Uh, coming to the methodological approaches, that was also quite refreshing. Um, most of the studies, at least I know about uh, uh, involving, uh, say, uh, um, SAM or uh, AFSAN or the Hungry uh, uh, Cities uh, projects have uh, tended to focus mostly on the quantitative approaches. It's not a bad thing, it's, it's good, it has its merits. Um, um, but during the past two days or the, these two days, there were quite a number of studies which uh, were um, um, anchored on uh, ethnographic approaches. Uh, I think it was one or two which used the photo voice approach uh, I think that just broadens the uh, methodological uh, methodological approaches, and it makes the whole thing um, quite uh, quite exciting. Um, maybe there, uh, as I uh, conclude here, uh, the issue of the epistemic trap uh, involving uh, you know, migration in silos. I think this is something we need to, you know, as we try to get out of that uh, 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 
trap out of the silo factor. Um, how best should we uh, do these studies on, uh, on the nexus or especially the nexus studies? Um, the papers approached, uh, um, uh, the nexus approach, the presentations in, in a variety of ways. Again, I think that's interesting. I think that's good. Um, but I think we also need to think about, um, I, I'm not suggesting that uh, uh, it's probably the, 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 the way. Um, if there is going to be um, um, comparative assessments and analysis uh, across the globe, um, do, do, do we need to apply a standard methodology for this nexus approach? Well, um, some of the, uh, for example, uh, the WEF, food, water, you know, energy and food, they tend, people operating in that, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, area of study, they've used broad methodological approaches, which you know, you know, once you know, ah, it's a WEF uh, study, um, they tend to approach in, uh, in a certain way. Uh, again, this is food for thought. Um, you know, diversity makes it uh, exciting, interesting, uh, as we have seen. Um, uh, but if the goal at some stage is to try to make certain generalizations, uh, comparisons, and so on, uh, maybe the, method, uh, the issue of uh, methodology uh, uh, will need to be um, uh, addressed. And um, to conclude, I, I should say, I think we are, we are doing extremely well. Uh, uh, this conference uh, has been quite uh, uh, stimulating. And uh, also uh, during this conference, it became clear that uh, the studies are not just urban food issues uh, and migration. The rural connection uh, uh, came out uh, uh, clearly. Uh, and in some cases, we might want to have rural, peri-urban, and so on. The reason why it is important to include that, uh, some of the migrants these days, because of some of these crises, uh, for example, uh, related to uh, climate change, hydrometrological uh, um, you know, extremes, floods, and so on, uh, you find you have rural groups migrants migrating from rural areas to other rural areas or uh, to peri-urban areas. So um, maybe that, uh, that's um, uh, something which needs to be encouraged. But as I've said, there are already a number of uh, papers which are addressed uh, uh, the rural uh, factors. And given those few words, um, I don't know if uh, I remembered my <laughs> grandfather's advice or not, I want to thank you, uh, Jonathan Crash, for and your team for putting together this, um, uh, you know, uh, impressive conference. And uh, I think it's really the beginning of uh, good things to come. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for those really interesting uh, remarks and excellent summing up of the main uh, issues that have arisen. Um, I really like the idea that we're on the beginning, at the beginning of a journey and we've already uh, achieved so much. Uh, so who knows what it will look like in, uh, in a few years time. Um, also, I, this, this idea of, the, of these curious silos that seem to exist and, and, and they certainly exist in the world of international organizations and international uh, development. What's less clear to me is why they should continue to exist in the academy and in, in, in the research community. And uh, I think we have an opportunity here to, 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 um, to, to break those down uh, and in fact, to, to, to then um, sort of lead the whole process of, of breaking down the silos at the more general uh, level of international development uh, agendas uh, to the point where 
these important and critical issues and intersections can't be ignored uh, anymore. So thanks very much uh, for those uh, for those remarks and for agreeing uh, to sum things up. Um, I will uh, finally hand the uh, the mic back to the co uh, organizer and host uh, Rajan uh, for his uh, some concluding uh, reflections. And um, over to you, Rajan. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, and also Daniel for giving you know the remarks were so brilliant. I would say that you know we are first year, first year of the mindful project. So I think I'm again want to say that uh, you know I think when we when I approached Jonathan to be part of the seminar, we advertised. I never thought the papers would be so variants and so you know like we have covered almost uh, all regions in the world. I think that was, uh, I think that was, I never even thought about that. And all the paper presented, which I was sitting, of course, difficult to sit for three hours together, but I sat, almost listened to all the presentations, you know, all the four sessions, close to 16 presentations. I think all had something new to say, something different, something enriching, you know, in the sense, it's not just a replication of what they have done earlier. I think something, everybody, you know, I, I can look, I can give a lot of example, but I don't want to say that right now because, we're almost running out of time. But I want to thank Jonathan. And also, it is your first year of uh, my food. It is our second year of annual conference at Imad. I think we should come back maybe after five years, your last year of your my food. Again, back maybe it is a seventh <laughs> annual conference, international conference of Imad, because we do every year. Already, I'm, I'm already with your partner working on the third year now. So maybe seventh year when we run, maybe I'll ask you again. Maybe that may be a closing year of this SSHRC project. Maybe you have a longer seminar, maybe offline, maybe in India or maybe in uh, Canada, I don't know. I think we should come back together again after five years to do something. Of course, we should also bring out some, some publications based on this seminar. I think I have seen wonderful papers. We should think of probably a maybe special issue in journal, like I was looking at a journal like a global food policy. But uh, I thought of talking to the editor himself, you know. So maybe we'll do something, uh, you know, you know, uh, great things together, and hope to meet Jonathan very soon, face to face, and then probably meeting other partners at some network where probably we'll meet face to face. I think time has come now. I was telling everybody, even Noma in in in, in Washington, they have a chairs meeting now face to face. Uh, I think we should start maybe one meeting of all the my food partners at one place. It can be anywhere globally. Not necessarily in, in, in Canada, it can be in South Africa, it can be in India, it can be in Singapore, we have all the, or it can be in Qatar, we have partners, you know. So I think we should, uh, I think Jonathan will lead the way for us to meet face to face and, and, uh, and create more projects, more teams, more research. I think we have a lot of ideas even gathered from these research uh, seminars. I think we'll go back and uh, thank you, Jonathan, once again, the, all the chairperson, all the presenters, all the people and all the participants, you know, some of them were you know, uh, you know, attending almost all the session, and I would like to thank all of them. And that is it from my side, Jonathan. So nothing is there, and I think we can say goodbye to everyone. Thanks to Sujada who was uh, helping us, and uh, uh, Sengong and other team from uh, from uh, my four team, and also from the Imad. We had a lot of people. I think Anand is still there, and other partners in Imad like Sunida and other people. You know, I don't want to name them because there is always a lot of people in the background. Like a movie, you know, when the movie is only the hero. <laughs> but the behind the hero, there may be sometimes 100 people, you know, some cameraman, somebody even putting up your hair. Hair should look like that, you know. So I think I think there are a lot of people behind both me and Jonathan. And I want to take this opportunity to that invisible, invisible people who are helping us. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Rajan. Yeah, it's true. I always sit in, at the end of a movie to appreciate the, the hundreds of people uh, who are involved, although I'm not never sure what some of the uh, roles are. Like you get people who are key grips and uh, gaffers and so forth. Apparently, these are all uh, behind the scenes. So I would like to thank our key grips and gaffers uh, for this particular uh, conference. Um, and you're quite right. I mean, it would be nice to, to come back in five years time to have another uh, joint uh, event. But in the meantime, you're right, there will be an annual My Food uh, conference that will take things forward. 
and uh, we're in the early stages of planning uh, an event for um, uh, probably or hopefully about April or May uh, next year and uh, possibly with uh, partners in South Africa in Cape Town uh, at the University of the Western Cape so that's uh, something we'll be um, you know I mean the, the thing is that Zoom has made things like this possible right mm -hmm. Uh, so it is. It has been fantastic from that point of view. But as you say, there's the, nothing beats uh, face to face, and uh, we look forward to um, seeing people in in, uh, in in hopefully in South Africa in uh, in April next year. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating, and um, we will uh, see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.